and we a special word of welcome to all of the school kids here today. Uh, we hope that we have an entertaining afternoon for you. Also, uh, a, a special word of welcome to Gregor Jäcker, the new head of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in South Africa. Konrad Adenauer Foundation has been our partner for many years, and we've always been impressed by the manner in which it supports the principles of constitutionalism and democracy and open debate in South Africa. So it's a particular pleasure for me to welcome Gregor and to, uh, <coughs> to acknowledge what Conrad Adenauer Foundation has meant for our foundation and I think for South Africa. Uh, I'm going to invite Conrad uh, Gregor <coughs> to say a few words uh, in the opening. It'll be his first address to an audience in South Africa. He's just recently arrived. And then I will make some more introductory remarks about our conference today and what we hope to achieve. Gregor. Dear Mrs. de Klerk, dear Dave Stewart, distinguished guests, esteemed speakers, and friends of the F.W. de Klerk Foundation, good afternoon. I have great pleasure in participating today at my first F.W. de Klerk Foundation annual conference, an event which my predecessors and colleagues consider one of the most important events in South, African, South Africa's annual political calendar. And as a matter of fact, it is also my first official welcoming remark as the new resident representative of CAS South Africa. I'm very honored and I'm very glad to be here with you this afternoon. And it's really wonderful to be posted um, to beautiful Cape Town after previous assignments in Congo, Lebanon and Iraq. This, this event, coming early in the year, resets our sights from the political trenches back to the political heights that this country is capable of. Today's event honors the 2nd February 1990 speech by President de Klerk to Parliament when he initiated the end of apartheid through extraordinary principle and boldness. This paved the way for a non-racial and democratic South Africa that we so often take for granted these days. To begin, I would like to recognize the warm relationship that the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, CAS, and the F.W. de Klerk Foundation share through, share through shared work and history, but also in both having the tremendous pleasure of carrying their eponymous funders' values in the future. Both President de Klerk and Chancellor Konrad Adenauer saw beyond their time and navigated the most difficult of challenges. Through his leadership and reforms immediately after World War II, Chancellor Konrad Adenauer laid the groundwork for the economic and political success story of modern Germany a country that was largely destroyed. And both leaders, Konrad Adenauer and President F.W. de Klerk, who dismantled the immoral and illegal system of apartheid in South Africa with Nelson Mandela, established through extraordinary statecraft a new consensus and stability that was rightly lauded. As a think tank, Closely allied to the German CDU party of former Chancellor Angela Merkel, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung promotes democracy, human rights, the rule of law through, all, through more than our 100 offices worldwide. We foster dialogue between policymakers, actors from the private sector and civil society and by bringing together people who embrace their societal responsibility, we promote, we promote the establishment of professional networks and the exchange of innovative ideas to tackle current challenges. 
and there is no denying the fact that our foundation could not achieve its objectives without strong local partners, such as the F.W. de Klerk Foundation. Today's event reflects on some of the pillars that support the constitutional order in South Africa. The media, Chapter 9 institutions, NGOs and the courts play a key role in defending the Constitution's values, which were arrived at through careful compromise and negotiation by representatives of all parts of society. Is the Constitution perfect? Of course not. But it does represent, as some say, a birth certificate for a unified nation of South Africa. A vision and an idea of what this society can be, if not eternally riven. The Constitution aims to make a single nation, despite the burning differences between the urban and rural, rich and poor, different races and regions. In spanning the tensions of this ambition, the South African Constitution serves as an inspiration internationally. Where the Konrad Adenauer Foundation's position to the Constitution is clear through its promotion of the rule of law, I would like to say a few words about CAS promotion of multi-party democracy. Today's event recognizes the crucial actions in defending the Constitution. But to fill the Constitution with life, to fill it with internal strength, instead of enabling its necessary defense, requires a functioning multi-party democracy. A strong democracy needs strong political parties. And my home country, Germany, learned its lesson. And it was a horrible one. The key reference to mention here is the fate of the Weimar Republic in the 1920s in Germany, whose shaky democracy and weak political parties was eaten by the dictatorship of Adolf Hitler that led to the Holocaust and the Second World War. The failure of political parties in combination with a high unemployment rate at this time, a dire economic situation, demagogues, a poor and frustrated population created the pathway for a historic disaster in the failure of democracy, which caused endless suffering. And that was, without any doubt, the bleak side of history. The countering picture to say the perfect model of a political party democracy, at least in political theory, is that of a country with, a large political, with large political parties based on common values and rooted in social networks, operating with strong inner party democracy to contribute to the common good rather than simply getting a job in politics. Parties in a well-working democracy shape political opinion making and are not just more in, in touch with the citizens, but are made up of citizens. And by being organizing vehicles for active citizenry, political parties enable constructive compromise making. Political parties are the heartbeat of healthy democracies that maximize human dignity. As a representative of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, I encourage, I encourage those in this room and those watching to support the media, NGOs, Chapter 9, and courts in defending the Constitution. But in my support for a democracy with well-working political parties, I also encourage you to join a political party to influence your branch, province, and party leadership towards principled party activity. The future of South Africa and of its constitution depends on it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gregor.
2023 is going to be an exciting year for the F.W. de Klerk Foundation. This is our first event, but it will certainly not be the last. On the 18th of March, which is F.W. de Klerk's birthday, we plan to start to release a series of 17 biographical videos on the life of F.W. de Klerk. We'll be issuing one every two weeks, and they will enable people who are interested in our history to get first-hand insight into the personality and the family and the politics of the man who changed South Africa. Then on the 21st of March, we'll be issuing our annual Human Rights Report Card, which has become an institution, which we identify the threats to human rights in South Africa. And we categorize them and we say whether things are getting better or things are getting worse. And it's not all bad news, as you will, as I will mention later. Then on the 24th of March, we have the 30th anniversary of F.W. de Klerk's announcement to Parliament that South Africa had <laughs> abolished its nuclear weapons program. He remains the only national leader who has ever abolished a nuclear weapons program developed by his own country. And this is something that we all need to take account of in a world where the threat of nuclear weapons is growing month by month and day by day. Then later in the year, we plan to launch our Center for the Constitutional Transformation of South Africa. We're going to create an exhibition at our offices in Hatfield Street on the process that changed South Africa from apartheid to non-racial constitutional democracy between the mid-1980s and 1996. Because we think this is the most important story in South Africa's history. We would like to share it with everyone, particularly with the younger generation. And we're going to have it replicated on the internet as well. But we hope that visitors to our exhibition will understand the processes by which we South Africans came together to change the country forever. And then, uh, finally, on the 11th of November, we have, we'll have our second annual F.W. de Klerk Memorial Lecture on the anniversary of his passing. So it's going to be an interesting and busy year for us. But today, of course, is a very special day. It was on this day, as, as Gregor pointed out, 33 years ago, that F.W. de Klerk launched the process that changed South Africa forever. On that morning, I hosted a meeting of the foreign and local media at a building just beside Parliament. We met at six o'clock. We had uh, ministers Gerrit Filjun uh, and Stoffel van der Merwe and Kubi could see a present to brief the press on what this speech meant before they all ran off to file their stories after de Klerk had had issued the speech. Uh, after the, the, reading the speech, Alistair Sparks, a veteran critic of the National Party government, gasped to David Ottaway of the Washington Post, my God, he's done it all. The culmination of the process that F.W. de Klerk launched on that day was the adoption of the 1996 Constitution, which articulated a vision of the country that we wanted to become. It would be a society based on foundational values, including human dignity, equality, non-racialism, a society that would, among, among other goals, aim to heal the divisions of the past, and improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. Now, 33 years later, we are all too painfully aware of the degree to which we have fallen short of this vision. 
It's not my intention to repeat the litany of woes that beset our country and the vast majority of our people. We read about them, we talk about them every day, every moment. I would, however, like to note that despite these shortcomings, we have clung onto some of the other important elements in our founding vision. We still have an open society with freedom of expression and political activity. We, still, we are still a functioning multi-party democracy with regular elections. The government still complies with court judgments that strike down legislation and actions that are unconstitutional. The fact that the constitution and free institutions, though frequently under attack, still survive is of crucial importance for the future of all South Africans. However, the survival of the constitution cannot be taken for granted. According to a study by Professor Tom Ginsberg of the University of Chicago, there have been more than 900 constitutions throughout the world since 1789. Their average duration is only 17 years, 12 years shorter than our constitution. Constitutions last on average for 32 years in Europe, 12.4 years in Latin America, and 10.2 years in Africa. The French have had 17 constitutions since the 1789 revolution, so many that according to one joke, the latest constitution is not available at French libraries because they do not stock periodicals. <laughs> of course, the oldest, most resilient, and most successful constitution is that of the United States, which has lasted since 1788. The fact that our constitution has survived until now is unusual in our continent and indeed in the world. However, the Constitution is critically important. If it had not been for the Constitution, the institutions and the freedom that it ensures, it is doubtful whether we would have survived the onslaught of state capture under the presidency of Jacob Zuma. It was because of the relentless efforts of investigative journalists that the enormous scale of state condoned criminality was exposed. It was because of the firm, dignified and resolute investigations and actions of advocate Tuli Madoncella, our public protector, that irresistible pressure was exerted on President Zuma. It was because of her initiative that the Zondo Commission was appointed and ultimately exposed for once and for all the full extent of corruption and criminality involved in state capture. Fearless non-governmental organizations like CASAC, like the Helen Sussman Foundation, Freedom Under Law, played essential roles in doggedly combating unconstitutional legislation and actions through successful litigation in case after case until President Zuma was ultimately forced to step down. Finally, it was the courts that in epic cases made it impossible for President Zuma to continue in office. Now, once again, South Africa faces what may well prove to be existential challenges. According to our latest human rights report card, the principal threats to human rights in South Africa include the unsustainable conditions of poverty, inequality, unemployment, violent crime, and declining social, educational, and health services that constitute the lived, the daily lived experience of a majority of South Africans. 
The second one that we identified was any continuation of the severe and arbitrary restrictions of a wide range of basic rights imposed under the Disaster Management Act to deal with the COVID crisis. This was our report from the previous year, of course. Then thirdly, any re repetition of the collapse of law and order experienced in KwaZulu-Natal during July 9, 2021. And finally, the failure of government still to take credible steps to combat corruption. Sadly, these threats continue and we shall have to remain <coughs> vigilant in our continuing efforts to confront them. We should be particularly concerned about proposals to declare a state of disaster over the current energy crisis. We saw how the COVID state of disaster was abused to extend almost limitless powers to the government and how it opened the doors of corruption. The government's actions and regulations under the state of disaster with COVID circumvented the foundational values of the rule of law and democratic governance by effectively nullifying the authority and oversight role of parliament and by making provision for the indefinite and arbitrary extension of the state of disaster without any parliamentary permission. Regulations promulgated under the state of disaster severely limited fundamental rights and freedoms including the security of the person, religion, assembly, movement, trade, occupation and profession and education. We must guard against the possibility that a state of disaster to deal with the energy crisis might lead to similar violations of fundamental rights and abuses of power. There will almost inevitably be many occasions in the coming months and years when investigative journalists, chapter nine institutions, activist NGOs and our courts will once again have to step into the breach to defend fundamental constitutional principles. The situation will become particularly critical during the run up to the 2024 elections in the course of which support for the ANC, the dominant party in our democracy since 1994, may fall well below 50%. It is for these reasons that the F.W. de Klerk Foundation decided to dedicate this conference to the question of defending the Constitution under these circumstances. This is why we have also invited speakers to address the roles that investigative journalists, chapter nine institutions, activist NGOs, and the courts have played in defending the constitution in the past, and the role that they envisage for these institutions in continuing to defend the constitution in the stormy years that may lie ahead. We have we have invited Adrian Besson, the editor-in-chief of News24, to talk about the role of investigative journalists and the media in defending the Constitution. Paul Hoffman, the director of Accountability Now, will deal with the crucial role of Chapter 9 institutions in the past and in the years that lie ahead. Lawson Naidu, the head of CASAC, the Council for the Advancement of the South African Constitution, will share his perspective on the role of activist NGOs. And finally, Emeritus Professor Hugh Corder, former professor of public law at UCT, will talk about the role of the courts in defending the Constitution in the past and in the future. We shall break for tea, at 3 p.m., I'm advised there will be scones as well. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll follow the addresses of our speakers with a panel discussion, during which members of the audience and those who are following the conference on the internet will be welcome to ask questions. As you will note, you all have cards on your seats. 
please write down your questions on them and pass them to members of our team for the attention of the panelists when we enter our panel discussion. Finally, I should like to conclude my remarks with the observation that the preservation of the Constitution and the foundational values that it incorporates will be of key importance in determining whether the great transformation of our society that was launched 33 years ago will succeed or fail. Upon, upon the outcome of this question hangs the future freedom, security, prosperity, and happiness of everyone in South Africa. Thank you. I would now like to ask Adrian Besson to uh, address us about the role of investigative reporters and the media. And I must warn you that we are told, believe it or not, there will be load shedding <laughs> during his speech. So it will be, a, I, I, we are assured a 30 second break, but don't be alarmed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We do live in interesting times. I'm also told, Dave, that while we're sitting here, a former bank robber is being sworn in as a member of council in Johannesburg and may become the new MMC for transport, Mr. Kenny Kunene. <laughs> it's not a joke. Um, and that SA Tourism has confirmed that they indeed uh, intend sponsoring um, uh, Tottenham Hotspur, not Spurs, I'm told, uh, to the tune of one billion rand uh, for tourism fees. Uh, it did strike me this morning that I don't think anyone told Lindiwe Sisulu their nickname is the Lily Whites. <laughs> she would not have approved of that. Dave, thank you very much for the invitation. Elita, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to try and stick, I have to stick to time, so let me keep that thing here. <clears throat> Researching today's topic left me with a deep sense of pride for the much maligned media industry in our country. Going back to the best and most impactful pieces of investigative journalism since 1994, made me realize just how pivotal journalists and the media have been in upholding the values of the Constitution, protected, aided, and strengthened by Section 16. Although the topic of the conference is defending our Constitution since 1994, it would be incorrect and remiss of me not to give credit to the long and proud history of investigative journalists and investigative journalism pre-1994. We stand on the shoulders of giants like Ruth First to expose the apartheid era's terrible labor conditions and social injustices. Ruth was assassinated by government agents in Maputo in 1982. Joyce Sikakani Rankin, who investigated the... Hello. Hello. Ah, there we go. That was much less than 30. Joyce Sikakani Rankin investigated the brutality of forced removals and became the first black woman reporter for the Round Daily Mail. Janet Wilhelm, who exposed the apartheid security forces who were recruiting Mozambicans refugees to destabilize that country in the Weekly Mail. Charles Bloomberg, Bloomberg, who exposed in the Sunday Times under the editorship of the late Joel Mervis the impact of the Afrikaner Bruderbond on the development of apartheid. Henry Nkumalu, Mr. Drum, who signed up as a farm worker to tell the story of slavery in South African farms and got himself imprisoned to expose police brutality at Johannesburg Central Prison. Max Dupree and Jacques Poe, who exposed Flakplas and the apartheid pol police state-sponsored hit squads. There were many more like them, Anton Harbour, Joe Tlolwe, Eddie Koch, Philippa Gass, and Ivor Powell and others. Many of them were assaulted, threatened, intimidated, or even killed in an anti-democratic era that required enormous sacrifice to pursue and expose the truth. I can proudly say that despite the most serious attacks on media freedom, 
post-1994. None of us have suffered the fates of the likes of Ruth First and Henry Nkumalu, who were both assassinated in the line of duty. Does this mean everything is hunky-dory in the states of Denmark? Certainly not, but I will get back to that. Since the advent of democracy, South African investigative journalism, now armed with constitutional protection under Section 16, have been at the forefront of holding to account political, public, and private power. The Constitutional Court has on numerous of occasions strengthened and entrenched the media's right under Section 16, most famously in Kumalu versus Holomisa and others, when the court stated in 2002, quote, the print, broadcast, and electronic media have a particular role in the protection of freedom of expression in our society. Every citizen has the right to freedom of the press and the media and the right to receive information and ideas. The media are key agents in ensuring that these aspects of the right to freedom of information are respected. The ability of each citizen to be a responsible and effective member of our society depends upon the manner in which the media carry out their constitutional mandate. As Dean Jay stated in the High Court of Australia, the, the Constitutional Court continues, quote, the freedom of the citizen to engage in significant political communication and discussion is, last, is largely dependent upon the freedom of the media. I just want to read that again. The freedom of the citizen to engage in significant political communication and discussion it is largely dependent upon the freedom of the media. Close quote. The media thus rely on freedom of expression and must foster it. In this sense, they are both bearers of rights and bearers of constitutional obligations in relation to freedom of expression. Close quote for the Constitutional Court. I can proudly say that the following examples show how, just how the media has adhered to the court's wishes from 2002. In 1996, the Sunday Times and the Mail and Guardian blew the whistle on the mystery of a 14 million rand. We still thought that was a lot of money at the time. <clears throat> 14, one four million rand donation to the health department and in Kosazana Zuma then to put up a musical called Sarafina. It was one of the first big scandals in post-apartheid South Africa that highlighted the dubious links already between the ANC and private donors. In the late 1990s, the Sunday Times and the Mail and Guardian started asking questions of what we now refer to as the arms deal, a transaction initiated by the old National Party and gladly taken over by the ANC. In 2001, the Sunday Times' Mzilikazi wa Africa this revealed how the ANC's chief whip, Tony Yengeni, received a massive discount on a Mercedes-Benz 4x4, courtesy of a German arms company. The story led to Yengeni's conviction and imprisonment for fraud. And those of you who follow Twitter would see that he is quite emboldened these days, even posing with that old Mercedes-Benz the other day again, saying that Mercedes should pay marketing fees. <laughs> <clears throat> Two years later, Sam Saul revealed in the Mail and Guardian how Jacob Zuma was linked to an arms deal bribe from French arms firm Thales. You all know the history of this case too well. In 2005, Shabir Sheikh was imprisoned for corruption and fraud. Jacob Zuma's case is still in court and will continue on the 17th of April. In the mid-2000s, journalists like Sam Sol, Stefans Brimmer, Martin Wells, and Dion Basson started asking questions of a young new mining magnet, Brett Kebel, who was dishing out dollars to the ANC Youth League. It was later revealed that Kebel pulled off a massive fraud on a number of old mining houses, got involved with the wrong crowd, and eventually died in the most bizarre so-called assisted suicide. The Kebel story eventually led to the Mail and Guardian's crack team of journalists. Uh, it led the team of journalists to South Africa's police chief at the time and head of Interpol, Jackie Salibi. After Salibi was linked to cash in bags from Glenn Agliotti, a drug dealer with a penchant for fancy suits and cappuccinos at Santon City, the dominoes started to fall, culminating in Salibi's imprisonment for corruption in 2010. 
That was probably the last big corruption case we had in South Africa 13 years ago. In 2005, the Sunday Times revealed that some parliamentarians were stretching their travel vouchers much further than they should have, culminating in what became known as Travelgate, leading to a number of MPs pleading guilty to charges of fraud and theft. Many of them remain in Parliament and in the ANC. Around this time, I started scratching around the affairs of an unknown services company from Krugersdorp called Bosasa. After DA MP James Self picked up, they were benefiting massively from correctional services department tenders. In 2006, I could reveal in Build newspaper that Bosasa and their CEO Gavin Watson paid correctional services boss Lindam T and co-wrote the tenders. They won with the department. In 2007, the Daily Dispatch, a proud beacon of local journalism in South Africa, revealed the shocking conditions at the Freire Hospital. Journalist Chandre Prince, Brett Horner, and Ntandu Makuba exposed the high infant mortality rates in the first of many investigative pieces focusing on collapsing service delivery. In 2009, Mail and Guardian political journalist Manu Rousseau decided to visit Nkandla, where she heard former President Jacob Zuma was building a sprawling new compound. She returned with the story that the state would pay millions of rands, culminating in a constitutional court judgment and Zuma having to repay a large part of the money. In 2011, I worked with then colleague Pete Trampedi on a tip we received at City Press about Julius Malema's lavish lifestyle. We exposed how Malema used the secret family trust in his son's name to receive tender profits from government projects in Limpopo. The same Pete unfortunately went on to work for Iqbal Survey and now writes stories about babies that don't exist. In 2012, Jacques Poe, now working for at the time working for Media 24's investigative unit, revealed the collusion by construction companies working on the 2010 Soccer World Cup stadiums. This investigation led to fines of over a billion rand, almost 1.5 billion rand, being dished out to the construction cartels by the Competition Commission. Also in 2012, I revealed in City Press with colleague Paddy Harper our former crime intelligence boss, Richard Mdluli, had promised his loyalty to Zuma to continue his ANC leader shortly before corruption charges against Mdluli were dropped. Later years, it became clear that this was a key moment in Zuma's capture of the criminal justice system. You might remember that Linus Breitenbach was removed from the NPA at the time. Later in the same year, Andrew Trench and the Media 24 investigations team proved how a Limpopo textbook tender for 300 million rand was botched by an ANC linked company called Edu Solutions, leading to thousands of children being without textbooks for an extended period of time. Also in 2012, Greg Marinovich, the veteran famous photojournalist writing for the Daily Maverick, exposed how police assassinated striking miners at Marikana at Copy 2 during one of the bloodiest days in democratic South Africa. In 2015, the young investigative journalist Peter Louis Mayberg revealed in Rapport and City Press how Prasa bought trains that were too tall for South Africa's rail system for 600 million rand from a Spanish company. You can see how far we came from the 14 million for Sarafina <clears throat> to 600 million. Investigations into private sector shenanigans have flourished, with journalists like Rob Rose leading the pack. In 2016, he blew the whistle on Steinoff and their dodgy dealings and continued his investigations for the financial mail that first introduced Marcus Euster and his scams to the rest of the world, outside of Stellenbosch, I guess. Also in 2017, Suzanne Fenter from Report took a simple tip-off on Facebook and investigated it to expose the 94 deaths at Life Isedimeni, an institution for mentally ill patients in Johannesburg. On 1 June 2017, 
The country was rocked by the publication of the Gupta leaks by Daily Maverick, Amabungani, and News24. After being leaked, a trove of thousands of documents, Daily Maverick editor Branka Brickage decided to cooperate with Amabungani and News24 to publish in the most impactful way a series of stories that would change the course of history in South Africa, ultimately leading to Zuma's removal in early 2018 which Dave referred to earlier. In 2021, Mayberg revealed in Maverick how then Health Minister Zuelim Kize was now linked to a 150 million rand COVID-19 communications tender we have uh, awarded to, to a company called Digital Vibes, linked to his family, with payments going to his children and to a house owned by his family trust. This led to Mkize, who almost became ANC president in December, to his resignation and investigations by the SIU and the Hawks. Also in 2021, Raymond Joseph, the veteran journalist writing for Ground Up, started to reveal the Viper's Nest at the National Lotteries Commission, culminating in the resignation of the board and many of the executives, and the installation of a new board at the National Lotteries Commission. Last year, 2022, News24's Carl Cowan, Sipo Masondo, and Azara Karim exposed the ESCOM managers and companies behind a sophisticated scheme to use the Kusile Power Station project as their own personal piggy bank. And also last year, Jeff Weeks from News24 exposed what Gauteng health official Babita Diokuran had uncovered before she was murdered in cold blood outside her home in Johannesburg after dropping a daughter at work. As you can see from these examples, and my list is not at all conclusive, South Africa's investigative journalists have done their bit to safeguard democracy over the past 30 years, almost 30 years. Unfortunately, what we reveal is not always followed up by law enforcement agencies or end up in court with criminal prosecutions. This is an age-old frustration and something that I often tell my young colleagues they shouldn't worry too much about. Make sure that you put your investigation and your findings in the public, on the public record, because that is our job. What happens with that information is out of our hands, but nobody can then say they didn't know. The baton, civil society has taken up this baton, and over the past few years, since the Jacob Zuma state capture era, we have seen these um, organizations going to court and forcing the state to do its job. What does the future hold? The future of investigative journalism also in South Africa is going to be on digital platforms. As you may have noticed while I read these examples, many of the former examples were from newspaper publications, but of the, la of the latter ones are all now produced online, mainly by publications like News24, The Daily, Maverick, Amabungani, and Ground Up. That is because of the transformation of the media and of the changing economy of the media landscape. But these digital platforms do give us new exciting tools to illustrate our work for a much broader and visually savvy generation. Funding for our journalism will come from digital subscribers, from advertisers and sponsors or donors, often through philanthropic institutions. Our work is far from over. Today, as we sit here, my colleague Karen Morn, News 24's specialist legal reporter, had to appear in the Peter Maritzburg High Court on a spurious private prosecution case brought by Zuma against her and prosecutor Billy Downer. We will fight the case tooth and nail and defend Karen to the hilt. It is unsurprising that Zuma is the first person in democratic South Africa that wants to see a journalist jailed for doing her job. But our faith remains in the judiciary to see the case for what it really is. I'm happy to take questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. We asked you to inform us about the role of investigative journalists, and you really did a good job. <laughs> Thank you. 
Our next speaker is uh, Advocate Paul Hoffman, who is uh, the Director of Accountability Now and was the first director of our Center for Constitutional Rights years ago. Back in the day. <laughs> Back in the day. <laughs> And Paul is going to tell us about the role of Chapter 9 institutions in defending the Constitution and the past, and how he thinks they should defend them in the future. Thank you, Dave. It's great to be among so many friends all at the same time in the same place. When I looked at the... Sorry, Mike. I'm not as tall as Adrian, but you know... Tall stories in the media. <laughs> the, uh, the first patron of accountability now was Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu. And he had a habit when he heard good news of putting his very big hands up like this and saying, wonderful, wonderful. All I can say is it is wonderful to be back here with the the old firm, and when I retired in uh, 2006 to go and play with FW and Dave, I would never have guessed that I would get <laughs> an invitation in, in my old age. My Ridgebacks were very displeased that their routine was disrupted this morning. Their, their, their walk on the beach was almost in the dark, and uh, tending my roses just had to wait until later today. So... What is really wonderful about this gathering is that you are being treated to unity in diversity in action. You all will have noticed that when Dave stood up, he was wearing a white shirt, a tie, and a suit. When Adrian stood up, he had no suit, no tie. When it's Lawson's turn, he comes with a jacket, but no tie. When it's Hugh's turn, he comes with a suit, but no tie. And so I thought, in order to really balance it all, I would come with a tie, but no suit. <laughs> and that's what you've got, a diverse panel, which is what we aimed to do when we wrote the preamble of the Constitution. You have unity in diversity in action in the room. So thank you, Cass, for sponsoring this event. And thank you all, including those in cyberspace and those who have broken away from their school routines to be here today, for your attendance. My job is not as big as the job that Adrian has just done, because there are only six chapter nine institutions in South Africa, and I've been asked to, to talk about the role that they have played in defending democracy and the constitution in South Africa. I think that, like Adrian, I will move in chronological sequence, because that is the easiest way to uh, keep your audience awake on a hot afternoon when they've all had a very pleasant lunch and a cup of tea. Those of you who feel the need to have a nap, I will not be offended. <laughs> I'm very pleased to say that the Daily Maverick managed to publish a potted version of what I am going to say now uh, in the Maverick this morning. So those of you who want to switch off or catch up with TikTok or whatever it is that you do, after lunch, I think some of us, looking at the demographic in the room, like to have a nap after lunch. <laughs> Please just do it quietly, and I will, I will take you chronologically through the, the, the relevant history. I want to start in 44 BC in Rome. <laughs> I know I've only got half an hour, <laughs> but I will be quick. The idea of starting uh, there is because in that year, it was before the Christian era, there was an assassination in the Eternal City when Brutus and Cassius and others ganged up on uh, General 
Julius Caesar and murdered him. Assassinated, I think, is the word when somebody important gets murdered. So why did I bring this up now? Well, if you think about it, those words, et tu brute, have been immortalized by Shakespeare, and they jumped into my mind when I saw an article by one of the Ravonia Circle, who also enjoys the name Brutus, uh, that was published, I think, a week or ten days ago. And this is what he said. We are a nation that has surrendered ourselves to be led by fools. The current leaders cannot see, let alone imagine, South Africa beyond the current tide of destruction. None of the so-called leaders in our national parliament has articulated a compelling vision for South Africa. Meanwhile, a country in distress requires a leadership that embodies the qualities that Archie Brown asserts are desirable for modern political leadership. Integrity, intelligence, shrewd judgment, a questioning mind, courage, vision. The vision of the Constitution is perfectly clear. We respect human dignity, promote the achievement of equality and the enjoyment of human rights guaranteed to all in the Bill of Rights. And when I read that, I thought about what Oliver Tambo said before he died in 1993. The fight for freedom must go on until it is won, until our country is free and happy and peaceful, very similar to what Dave said at the end of his opening remarks. As part of the community of man, we cannot rest. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot rest now either because that criticism by uh, Brutus Malada of the Rivonia Circle, I would suggest to you, is an accurate criticism of the unfortunate state of affairs in politics today. When the New South Africa dawned after the 2nd of February speech, I discovered this morning that the 2nd of February is a really big day in our history because in 1659, the first wine harvest in South Africa took place. I want you to use that in the future, Dave. You don't have to pay royalties. So, what were they thinking about when they put Chapter 9 into our supreme law? What was it designed to do? What was it meant to achieve? Now, what we need to understand, because it does explain quite a lot of what has gone wrong, is that the compromise between the Afrikaner nationalists and the African nationalists, who were the two biggest negotiators in the Cadessa 1 and 2 process, When I start saying controversial things, my mouth goes dry. I don't know if it's fear or excitement. But the Afrikaner nationalists came from a parliamentary sovereignty in which what parliament said went. It was sovereign. And the ANC came from an association with the communists in which their guiding light was not parliamentary sovereignty. It was hegemonic control of all the levers of power in society. In society, mark you, not just in government. That is what uh, Lenin thought about at the beginning of the 20th century, and it is the mindset that Amandla Awetu brought to the negotiating table. Now, neither the stance of the Afrikaner nationalists, nor the dreams of the African nationalists had anything to do with multi-party constitutional democracy under the rule of law. In fact, what, what we have is a good compromise, which lawyers define as a solution where both parties are equally unhappy with the outcome. 
and the compromise that we reached in relation to the governance of the new South Africa was that we would convert ourselves into a constitutional democracy in which the constitution is supreme, the politicians cannot do as they please, the majority does not have more rights than the minority in spite of what Jacob Zuma told Lindiwe Mazibuko in parliament, and we have a situation in which any conduct or law that is inconsistent with the Constitution is invalid. Now, that is a very far cry from parliamentary democracy, and it is a far cry from seizing hegemonic control of all the levers of power in society because we regard the rule of law as supreme, we respect the separation of powers, we believe that there should be checks and balances on the exercise of power according to what the Constitution says, and we um, accept that we must have a free press, an impartial and independent judiciary, and a society in which inherent human dignity is respected. Now, the, the reason for putting chapter 9 into the Constitution, and it's not a chapter that you see in every Constitution, is that our founders recognized that the people of South Africa would have a lot of difficulty converting from being passive citizens in an authoritarian regime, most of them with no meaningful franchise at all, into active participants in the new democratic order. And so it was decided to create this fourth arm of government, that's what some academics are now calling it, a, a situation in which the chapter nine institutions are there to strengthen and support constitutional democracy. Now, whether they have done that is an open question. And the reason for that is that because the ANC has enjoyed a majority, Dave, you must tell me when I've got five minutes to go, and I'll go faster. Okay. <laughs> You must stop me because I haven't got a, I'm not as well organized as Adrian. I can't keep my phone going. So what, what, what we have in the chapter nine structure is institutions that do not answer to the executive in the country. Their reporting line, their accountability is to parliament, not to the cabinet. And that is very significant because parliament is a multi-party body, whereas the cabinet is at least dominated. I think at the moment Patricia DeLille is the only non-ANC member of the cabinet, and we will know quite soon whether she is still a member of the cabinet because a reshuffle seems to be imminent. So strengthening and supporting Constitutional democracy is what these six institutions are about. Now, I'm going to, because of time constraints, divide the six institutions into two categories. The, the institution with a long name, and I really wore a tie today because I have to show respect to people who are important, and I see that there are some uh, survivors of the institution with a long name in the room. And of course, Elita is here, and I always wear a tie when, when Elita is in the audience. So that institution, the Gender Commission, in my respectful submission, should be folded into the Human Rights Commission, become a desk or a division in the Human Rights Commission, and cease to exist as independent institutions, because we really can't afford them anymore and they haven't paid the rent since 1996. As far as the Independent Electoral Commission is concerned, it too has been a victim of uh, CADA deployment. Uh, when I started Accountability Now, 
I wrote a very strong letter to Pansy and Kakula, who was then the chair of the Independent Electoral Commission, and I said to her, you do realize that there hasn't been a fair election in South Africa since the 1994 election because the ANC and its associates are the beneficiaries of unorthodox fundraising methods via the arms deals, via the Hitachi Power Africa deal. Those, we all know about these things. So, the, your ex-husband made a big uh, donation to the ANC because he was in business with them. So, sorry, Elita, but I've said sorry before, and I know you're not guilty, so don't feel bad about it. The, the, the trouble is that you cannot have a fair election when all of the parties, bar one, do not have access to funding in the way that the ANC has chosen to fund itself. So let's get into the three functioning uh, Chapter 9 institutions. The most important of these is the Office of the Public Protector. Unfortunately, in 2017, it was captured by Jacob Zuma. He thought he captured it seven years earlier when he appointed Tuli Madonsela. And I think that was one of the biggest mistakes he made <laughs> in his entire political career. But since 2017, with Busi Siwe in Kwabani, who is currently facing uh, an impeachment inquiry, the Office of the Public Protector has not done what the Constitution has designed for it. And what the Constitution has designed is, in effect, a, an ombud-type body with teeth. Most, most ombuds around the world listen to complaints, make recommendations, and hope that everybody will play nice. The public protector in South Africa can make binding findings and order errant public functionaries to take appropriate remedial action, as the Constitution puts it, and this has been used to good effect, uh, if not by all of the public protector's leadership, certainly by uh, Tuli Maronsela. She fingered Berki Chele for his role in the World Cup uh, leases. She uh, was involved in the litigation around Nkandla, in which the EFF and the DA also participated which led to him being called a constitutional delinquent and put him on the slippery slope on the way out. And she investigated the complaints by the Jesuits and the DA that the Guptas and the Zoomers were far too close together for comfort. So to that extent, uh, Tuli Madonsela deserves a very large bouquet from those who love constitutional democracy and seek to see the law upheld. But for, thank you, I get it. I'm pleased to see somebody still awake in the room. Thank you. It's a hot afternoon, but that's why my jacket's on the chair. The, uh, I don't have air conditioning like Dave's, you see. So the, the, the bottom line with the Office of the Public Protector is that if it is operated as the Constitution intends, it is a useful uh, organization subject only to review by the courts if mistakes are made. And there have been many reviews on the watch of Busasimi Mkwabani that you've all read about in the press, and I'm not going to, uh, uh, to take you through everything from CIEX to uh, Pravin Gordon and even President Ramaphosa himself. Although I should mention that in relation to what was revealed in June last year, we are now in February this year, uh, concerning the Goma Goma cultures at Pala Pala, one would have thought that by now an independent, effective, Office of the Public Protector would have made public a report 
in relation to that complaint. It hasn't happened, and one wonders how much longer they can keep uh, spinning that one out. In relation to the South African Human Rights Commission, good work has been done, whistleblowers have been helped, a very comprehensive inquiry into the education system has, has been, been held, but the, the difficulty with the Human Rights Commission is that if it wants to enforce uh, any threats to or infringements of human rights by obtaining redress, it has to resort to the courts to do so. And because of the uh, deployed cadres that have been deployed in the Human Rights Commission, the, the uh, incidence of that kind of uh, litigation has not really happened, except perhaps on some isolated um, matters concerning the the uh, whistleblower's protection. Now, that brings me in this tour from 44 BC to the uh, Auditor General. The Auditor General has managed to keep its uh, institutional independence. It does do its work properly. It does record irregular and wasteful and fruitless exp expenditure in the public administration and some of the state-owned enterprises. It has even been given additional powers in order to uh, require of those fingered in um, uh, audits that are adverse to do something about what has gone wrong. But in general, what happens is that there is a debate about just how much has gone west and it's forgotten about because there is no follow through. And that's what Adrian got to towards the end of his time. And I'm going to use the rest of my time. How much have I got? Five. That's much more than I need because I'm only going to talk about five things. In spite of the criticisms of the, the uh, chapter nine institutions that I've leveled today, I do believe that their existence is useful to bedding down constitutional democracy in South Africa and that they need to be supplemented by a new institution which we, since 2012, have been calling the Anti-Corruption or Integrity Commission. We decided not to be anti after a while when nobody liked us being anti, so we gave it this new name, the Integrity Commission. And the mandate of the Integrity Commission, as you may have all guessed, is to prevent, or will be, to prevent, combat, investigate, and prosecute serious corruption. Not cool drink money for the traffic cop, big cases. It's, say, over 10 million rand. Now, the reason why we need this is because the minute Jacob Zuma came to power, he organized for the Scorpions, who were an effective anti-corruption body within the National Prosecuting Authority, to be closed down. Now, the National Prosecuting Authority is not as independent as the Chapter 9 institutions. It has a accounting officer, who is the Director General of Justice. It has a line to the minister, in, in terms of which the minister of justice is, uh, he, he takes final responsibility for the National Prosecuting Authority. So when the National Prosecuting Authority is enjoined by the Constitution to act without fear, favor, or prejudice, it is still constrained by this ministerial role and by the fact that the money is coming from the Department of Justice. That shouldn't be the case. We believe that the National Prosecuting Authority should be as independent as the Chapter 9 institutions. And I'm pleased to say that there are senior people in the NPA who think the same. That hasn't happened yet. So this new Chapter 9 institution is not a replacement for the Scorpions. It is not an alternative hawk's body. 
It is a combination of both, but it is compliant with what the Constitutional Court has laid down in relation to the criteria for effective and efficient anti-corruption machinery of state in South Africa. Those criteria arise, and you may wonder why we've been pleading about this since 2012. Well, they arise from the decision in what is known as Glenister II, a decision of the majority of the Constitutional Court that was handed down on St. Patrick's Day in 2011. That's the 17th of March, 2011, giving uh, government 18 months to fix up the Hawks. What happened was that the Hawks were tinkered with as little as possible, and to this day, the criteria have not been complied with. And if you don't believe me when I say that the criteria have not been complied with, you will remember that Adrian told us that Jackie Celebi and perhaps also John Block, people investigated by the Scorpions, are the last big fish to go down in South Africa. And it was a very long, it was, the Scorpions have been out of commission since, since 2009. So it really is a long time since we've had a proper uh, prosecution to finality of serious corruption. So what we learn from the uh, Constitutional Court majority judgment, which is binding on government, government is obliged to do what the court told it to do, and if, if, if reform is not uh, put on the table sometime soon, it will be necessary to litigate again to get proper enforcement of the Glenister rules. And now my five points. Please, if you don't remember anything I said from Julius Caesar up to now, remember what I say now. If you want to have effective and efficient anti-corruption machinery of state in South Africa, you need to have an independent, standalone unit that is STRS compliant. STRS stands for specialized, trained, independent, resourced in guaranteed fashion, and secure in tenure of office. Now, the Scorpions had most of those characteristics, but one thing they did not have was secure tenure of office. If a Chapter 9 institution is created, and it would have to be created by an amendment to the Constitution, which may upset CASAC, we'll hear quite soon about that, or it, it um, it may be a, a case of uh, re really attempting the impossible, which is to recapacitate the, the, um, the National Prosecuting Authority, which is littered with saboteurs, underpopulated, and lacking the specialist skills that um, are, are required to be able to take on complex uh, corruption cases. So the the weakness of the Scorpions was that they could be closed down by a simple majority in Parliament, and that's in fact what happened. A Chapter 9 institution cannot be closed down unless two-thirds of the members of the National Assembly support such a move. So that means that the people working in that organization are in a position where they don't have to look over their shoulders to see who's breathing down their neck. They don't have to worry about being fired for doing their work properly, and they are able to get on with countering the corrupt. If we don't do that, the corrupt are going to do what has happened to every empire in every era since the beginning of time. They are going to destroy not only constitutional democracy, but the quality of life. There will not be peace that is secure. There will not be progress that is sustainable. And there will not be the prosperity that is equitably shared, all of which is what the Const Constitution contemplates. So uh, we, we need to get to a Chapter 9 institution 
sooner rather than later. And if I may advertise, because I'm advertising on behalf of CAS as well, there is a conference on this topic. I have given you the highlights package in five minutes. <laughs> it's all day on Monday next week. And if you go to uh, Mother Google and put in KAS South Africa, it's right there on the front page waiting for you. It has a link. You can watch it live on YouTube, or you can watch it later because a recording of the day's proceedings will, will be made and will be available on the internet. I think I've now filled up my five minutes and a bit more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, Paul's dedication to the Constitution, his fiery commitment to combating corruption is exceeded on occasion only by his optimism. I speak from experience. <laughs> Many years ago, Paul felt very strongly about the appointment of a commission of inquiry into the arms deal. And this was still under uh, President Zuma. And I said, Paul, there is absolutely no possibility that a commission of inquiry into the arms deal will ever be appointed. And I said, if it is appointed, I promise to give you a fantastic bottle of champagne. <laughs> well, of course, we got the Sariti Commission. <laughs> and. and <laughs> And, and true to my undertaking, I did give him a bottle of champagne. It was the best uh, champagne of the particular year from some place in Mpumalanga. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when Paul talks about the appointment of uh, an integrity commission, we must take him seriously. Because even President Ramaphosa has expressed his support for such an idea. So, Paul, I'm not going to take a bet with you on the, <laughs> the Integrity Commission, but I will share your optimism. <laughs> now we have a break for tea, and uh, it was going to be 20 minutes, but because of the extraordinary ability of our speakers to keep to their speaking times, we actually have 25 minutes. So please enjoy tea and, I am told, scones. <laughs> and return, please, by 20 past... <laughs> 20 past four, uh, four, three.
I wish to put it plainly that the government has taken a firm decision to release Mr. Mandela unconditionally. I look to the future with confidence and I appreciate the good spirit and the earnestness and the honesty which was a hallmark of the discussions. The Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided to award the Nobel Peace Prize for 1993 to Nelson Mandela and Frederick Wilhelm de Klerk. We did share and kindly participate in moments that in all humility on our parts might have helped her to shape our country, our continent, and in modest ways, the world. For me, the glass in South Africa is half full. It's not half empty. I also believe we have the capacity to resolve the outstanding problems and to remain as we were when we entered into our agreement, a beacon of hope for the rest of the world. Thank you very much.
I wish to put it plainly that the government has taken a firm decision to release Mr. Mandela unconditionally. I look to the future with confidence and I appreciate the good spirit and the earnestness and the honesty which was a hallmark of the discussions. The Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided to award the Nobel Peace Prize for 1993 to Nelson Mandela and Frederick Wilhelm de Klerk. We did share and kindly participate in moments that in all humility on our parts might have helped her to shape our country, our continent, and in modest ways, the world. For me, the glass in South Africa is half full. It's not half empty. I also believe we have the capacity to resolve the outstanding problems and to remain as we were when we entered into our agreements, a beacon of hope for the rest of the world. Thank you very much.
We've, um, we've now heard from, <clears throat> from Paul regarding the role of Chapter 9 institutions in defending the Constitution, and we've been informed by Adrian of the role of investigative journalists in, in defending the Constitution now and in the future. And now we're calling on Lawson Naidu, who's the Executive Secretary of the Council for the advancement of the South African Constitution, one of our most activist NGOs uh, with a great record in defending the Constitution. Lawson. Thank you, Dave, um, Mrs. de Klerk, Mr. Gregor Jacke, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by thanking the Foundation for the invitation to speak here today. I must admit I was initially a bit hesitant to accept the invitation, but I considered it an important opportunity to contribute to the contemporary discourse about the Constitution, perhaps from a slightly different perspective to what you might have imagined. The original brief of this address was titled Defending the Constitution, and I was asked to speak from a civil society perspective. And I want to emphasize that I do so as a representative of CASAC, and certainly not on behalf of the civil society sector. I felt some unease as, at the idea that the Constitution needs defending. It suggests that the Constitution is somehow vulnerable or under attack. If we learned anything from the state capture years, it is that our Constitution is a robust and solid one, that the institutions it establishes are able to withstand even the most intense pressure and that our judiciary remains committed to upholding the Constitution. That Constitution was stress tested in recent years, but it has emerged intact. Of course, we have witnessed opportunistic attacks on constitutional institutions and the, and the questioning of the Constitution's legitimacy in various political circles. But, and for now, these remain fringe ideologies in an otherwise sensible democratic discourse. Yet, and this may explain my unease, there is an emerging view that the Constitution exists as some kind of counter to political power and majority rule. That somehow there are certain groups or sections of society which are specifically, or which are specially or specifically 
protected by the Constitution, and thus that all attempts to achieve social and economic transformation are thinly veiled attacks on the Constitution, which should in turn be defended. That view has also given legitimacy to unfounded cynical claims about the Constitution's role in preserving un unequal socioeconomic conditions in our country. Needless to say, I think both views are wrong. So I've decided to talk, in te talk instead about promoting and realizing the vision of the Constitution and the role that civil society has to play in that significant task. To begin with, it is important to always have the context in which our Constitution was forged in our minds. As the preamble makes clear, it represents, and I quote, the foundations for a democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people and seeks to improve the quality of life of all citizens and to free the potential of each person. Now central to this vision is the task of undoing the legacy of centuries of colonialism and apartheid. It is this goal that animates the way in which the Constitution apportions public power, protects rights, and imposes duties. All of us can agree that we are far, very far, from being the society envisaged in that Constitution. Inequality, poverty, unemployment, corruption, crumbling infrastructure, weak law enforcement agencies, and a lack of accountability at all levels of government all undermine our efforts to build that society. And yet, that is no reason to abandon the transformative vision of the Constitution. Government is empowered and indeed is obliged to actively adopt and implement measures aimed at undoing the legacy of our sordid, racially divided past. Free basic education, universal health care, the social security system, and yes, affirmative action are in the, in the form of employment equity, empowerment policies, and preferential procurement are just some of the necessary constitutional ways of achieving this vision. Yet, they only scratch at the surface of the work that remains to be done. Land, that most emotive issue, remains an unresolved question that threatens to unravel the very fabric of our society. The Constitution itself is very clear on the need for land reform, restitution, and redress. But it rem remains an elusive goal not because of the provisions of Section 25 of the Constitution, but rather the lack of a clear strategy and political will to do what the Constitution espouses. I mention all of this to make a point about an emerging trend in some civil society quarters to almost automatically oppose any policy or legislative initiative which seeks to advance these goals. There are, of course, valid reasons to oppose some of these measures, as my own organization, CASAC, has done several times in the past. But it is something else to cast them as anathema to a constitutional uh, society, as attempts by a rogue government to act beyond the Constitution and the powers that it gives it. That is usually not the case. The Constitution requires the state to act both positively, that is, to actively, to actively act in the pursuit of certain goals, and negatively, to not interfere with individual freedoms to realize that vision. It is those positive measures to which we appear to be vigorously opposed. This is understandable, since any serious attempt to fundamentally alter social and economic relations in our country will require a reckoning with some of the ways in which sections of our own society continue to benefit from the legacy of oppression and systemic disadvantage. It is human nature to seek to preserve oneself and one's property, but to wield the Constitution as that shield, and only as a shield against socioeconomic transformation, is to betray its very purpose. 
I would argue that instead we should embrace enthusiastically the Constitution's transform transformative vision of an egalitarian society in which all of us enjoy an equal opportunity at human flourishing. The Bill of Rights guarantees several basic rights, the enjoyment of which are necessary for that human flourishing. Some of those rights, specifically the socioeconomic rights, require the state to act in ways that advance certain persons or groups of persons and to act in ways that are contrary to our own interests in order to make them a tangible reality for the vast majority of South Africans. We should not seek to undermine even the most benign interventions of, out of pure self-interest, but we must accept that the achievement of our constitutional vision will come at a cost, and that we will at times be the ones called upon to bear that cost. This is not to say that civil society should abandon its critical role as a watchdog over the state and its institutions, and instead become a cheerleader for any and all of government's actions. Certainly not. We should continue to do as we have done in the past, but instead also embrace the Constitution's positive injunctions on government to act in ways that benefit the most vulnerable of all of us to agitate that it acts with haste where it hasn't, and to continue demanding accountability for its failures where it has failed. It is sometimes easy to retreat from the difficult work of seeking consensus and building coalitions on important issues across ideologies and political fault lines, and to pursue instead sectarian and special interests which affect only a small minority of us. We must resist this. We are called upon to build a nation, and that is what we need to do. In recent years, our socioeconomic crisis has worsened. Wages have either become stagnant or have declined in real terms. Unemployment, as you know, remains at an alarmingly high level, and inequality continues to grow and divide us as a nation. In addition, <clears throat> government spending on criti critical social goods, such as education and health, has also steadily declined amid attempts to enforce fiscal discipline or austerity. Matters are made worse, indeed, by the looting of state coffers during the state capture years and the slow pace with which our law enforcement agencies have tried to recoup the money that has been lost and stolen. This situation makes the realization of these socioeconomic rights all the more difficult, if not impossible, in the short term. These socioeconomic rights, as I've said, require government spending for their realization, which is part of what makes them so controversial, because it takes away that expenditure from somewhere else. Yet, government appears to be retreating from its obligations to fully realize these socioeconomic rights, which prompted the Financial and Fiscal Commission in its submission to Parliament in, on the 2022-23 budget to raise concerns about whether the budget was drawn up with this singular critical obligation in mind. Government has clearly taken its eye off the ball when it comes to realizing those socioeconomic rights. These difficult economic conditions pose a serious challenge to the realization of those rights. But the question is, what is our role as civil society in ensuring that these rights translate into actual material gains for South Africans? I referred earlier, as did other speakers, to the damage wrought by state capture and would like to say more on this, at least as it relates to our socioeconomic conditions. We know that state capture left us with hollow and ineffective institutions. The money, that money siphoned from the state will likely not be recouped anytime soon. But the damage wrought by state capture is far greater than we imagine and the rants and cents that are tabulated in the various reports of the Zondo Commission. 
CASAC, in its efforts to hold perpetrators of state capture to account, is working on a project specifically targeting those private sector enablers and conspirators who are involved in the implementation and facilitation of state capture to pay damages for the damage that they have wrought. We have been able to establish, for starters, that at, at least approximately two trillion rand was stolen from the fiscus over a decade. And, even that, and, and that even if the culprits were to pay back the amounts listed in the reports, we wouldn't come anywhere close to that figure. Yet there appears to be very little appetite for seriously pursuing these private sector enablers of, of uh, corruption and state capture, companies that benefited from the complete ransacking of the state. Our strategy is multi-pronged, multi -pronged, but ultimately seeks financial compensation for the role played by these uh, private sector entities, these companies, multinationals, with commensurate with the extent of their involvement and the damage inflicted on our institutions, our governance systems, and indeed, our democracy itself. This is, of course, not the only way in which we, be, we can be creative as well as proactive in vindicating socioeconomic rights, but it is an indication of what can be achieved if we do not hold on to the Constitution simply as a bulwark or a defense mechanism, but use it rather as a tool for fundamental transformation. For CASAC, this has always been our view of how this Constitution was intended to make real what it aspires to. In our founding principles and values, which were agreed when CASAC was established in September 2010, we said, and I quote, the realization of the socioeconomic rights is intertwined with civil liberties and political freedoms. Social and economic marginalization deprives people of their fundamental right to live with security and dignity and is a betrayal of our constitution. Endemic poverty and inequality renders South Africa a fragile society where the poor and the vulnerable especially women and children, are condemned to the fringes and easily exploited. There is an unacceptable and unsustainable gap between the vision of the Constitution and the lived reality for far too many citizens. This gap must be closed. Providing people with access to decent education, adequate housing and healthcare, and with the protection of a social security net is essential for a cohesive society and the future prosperity of our nation. I think those words resonate equally well today, almost 13 years later. The need to close that gap between the vision of the Constitution and the material lives of South Africans has never been more urgent. Opportunistic populists are co-opting the very real grievances that many South Africans have about the state of our country in order to attack the Constitution and pin the sorry situation on the Constitution and on the Constitution alone. To the extent, I would argue, that the Constitution may require defending, it would be foolhardy of us to expect our country women and men to defend a Constitution whose impact on their lives cannot be seen. We believe that people will only stand up and defend the Constitution and protect it if they are able to see and feel its benefit in their everyday lives. This is not to say that we must not focus on civil and political rights. They too are important, and as I said, they are interdependent. They're important not just in and of themselves, but as a tool for, my, for, for more fundamental societal transformation. In order for people to lawfully organize, to claim their rights, and to participate meaningfully in democratic decision making, civil liberties such as freedom of speech, access to information, a free press, and a free and tolerant political process 
are essential. Our Constitution has proven itself to be durable, and now is the time to embrace its transformative vision fully and to work towards ensuring that it can indeed achieve its promise of a pro prosperous, non-sexist, and non-racial democracy, unburdened by the legacies of the past. Thank you. Thank you, Lawson. That was uh, interesting, challenging. Uh, I don't think that civil society organizations from across the spectrum necessarily differ on the goals that are included in our constitution. As I said, the, the issue that we'd uh, identified as a foundation as the primary threat to human rights was the unacceptable level of inequality, deprivation, that is the daily lived experience of a majority of South Africans. Where I think we can have a really good and stimulating debate is how do we achieve that vision? I think there are different paths to the same goal. But thank you very much. And I'd now like to call on uh, Professor Hugh Corder to address us on the really crucial question of the role of the courts, because at the end of the day, they are the referee in this great rugby match of life that we are playing in South Africa. Thank you, Chair. Mrs. de Klerk, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm uh, Honored to be here this afternoon. Uh, like uh, a good constitutionalist, uh, one should never travel without a copy of the Constitution with one. Uh, I hope you've all got them uh, in your pockets. There are advantages and disadvantages to speaking last. Uh, the disadvantage is that one's prepared notes uh, may traverse the same territory as others have done. Uh, so you'll forgive me, I will adapt uh, as we go along. The advantage is one is entitled to respond, I suppose, to some of the remarks made by others. I am a Tottenham Hotspur supporter <laughs> and proud to be so. Uh, I think it's an astonishingly uh, sort of typical uh, action of Minister Sisulu uh, to head a department which makes such an outrageous uh, uh, gesture. I also want to respond to our first 14 million rand uh, corruption deal, Serafina II, Mogheni and Gemma, uh, the musical, the HIV AIDS uh, uh, musical. I had the honor at that point uh, to be the unpaid and, 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 uh, but, but thoroughly privileged legal advisor to the, the Parliamentary Portfolio Committee on Health. It was headed at that point by, it was chaired by Dr. Mantu uh, Chabalala Msimang, uh, but the real driving force on the committee was the magnificent uh, general practitioner from Atteridge Rule, Dr. Abe and Cuomo. Uh, and when uh, the news broke uh, about uh, Dr. Nkosazana uh, Dlamini Zuma and the 14 million, I uh, advised the portfolio committee that the Constitution gave them the full power to summon the minister to come and please explain and answer questions. That never happened uh, because I understand uh, many years afterwards I was told uh, that our founding president of our constitutional democracy summoned Dr. Chabalala Msimang to his office and said, my dear, this is not how we do things in the ANC and the invitation was withdrawn. I just want to say one last thing about defending the Constitution. I won't say those of us with memories going back uh, to the early 1950s, because I was only born in 1954, but you might remember that the Black Sash was founded as the defenders of the Constitution, uh, way back around the colored vote uh, removal uh, cases in the early 1950s. So I want to start also on this significant Memorial Day, 2nd of February, 
to think of, to make a few contextual remarks. Um, how did we get here uh, to where we are today? Uh, the judiciary has by and large stood firm, but it operates in the context of toxic politics and a ruling party which is corrupt and captured. Every institution has been affected by the toxicity of the political atmosphere and the dysfunction replicated throughout society. It is a mixture of things, outright corruption at worst and, and an almost embedded culture of mediocrity at best. So the saga, for example, of Judge President Klope, uh, which is a, a, an important issue within the judiciary and the courts, is a function, uh, a product of this. Also, the increasing brazenness within the dominant party means that it's open season to attack the Constitution. Let me be plain, and I differ slightly from, uh, I'm a member of Kazakh, uh, uh, and uh, I do think the Constitution is under attack, and I do think it therefore needs uh, an aggressive defense. But, uh, and I, I trembled slightly when our chair started quoting Professor Tom Ginsburg at the beginning, because I have some similar uh, statistics that I wanted to start uh, uh, with at the outset. They come from a book review of Tom Ginsburg's latest book, uh, and they come from an article by Professor Martin Lochlin of the London School of Economics, who surveys the rise and the growing decline of constitutional democracies. On his count, at the end of World War II, there were approximately 12 constitutional democracies in the world. By 1987, there were 66, and by 2003, there were 121. So out of the 100, approximately 200 members of the UN, 121 could be classified uh, as constitutional democracies. Interestingly, the number of coups d'etat in the period uh, 30 years or so before 1987 was 145, while since 1987, uh, there have been only 36 coups d'etat. It seems that those who wish to undermine the concept of a constitutional democracy prefer not formal overthrows of the constitutional regime, but rather substantial undermining of the core constitutional building blocks by means of constitutional amendments, weakening constitutional checks, weakening civil society, strengthening executive power, and suppressing political party competition. Lachlan further argues that the high point of the constitutional democratic regime was the period 2006 to 2011. While the classic model of a constitutional democracy, the American uh, constitution uh, sets that tone, was based on the liberal democratic notions of the advancement of life, liberty, and property, the new wave of constitutionalism, consequent upon the fall of the Berlin Wall and the rash of constitution making that started in Vintuk, came through Cape Town and proceeded through much of Commonwealth, so Southern and Eastern East Africa. That second wave and the wave, of course, of uh, constitution making in Central and Eastern Europe embrace, uh, embraces an avowedly social transformative agenda, as Lawson has just said, and as is exemplified in our own constitution. Since 2011, uh, and I will conclude with this point of Lachlan's, many constitutional democracies have been better characterized as defective democracies, undermined by the following sorts of developments. The effects of globalization on the sovereignty of national decision-making bodies and institutions. Extreme wealth imbalances. The rise of religious fundamentalism and populism. The effects of migration on the homogeneity of national populations. The growth of executive power, resurgent nationalism, and so on. So his conclusion is that by 2019, the era of constitutional democracy was in decline. It's cold comfort to know 
that we might be part of a global trend. But I believe that it's in this context that our own constitutional experience and an assessment of the role of the courts must be assessed. Let me remind everyone here, uh, and, and Paul uh, adverted to that, and, and Lawson as well, that when the interim, even the interim constitution, and then the final constitution was drafted, there was an acute awareness of the massive democratic deficit which we had to overcome because of the horrors and fundamental injustices of apartheid. Hence, the Office of Public Protector, the IEC, the Independent Broadcasting Authority, and the Human Rights Commission were already present, as well as the constitutionalization of the Office of Auditor General in the interim constitution from 27 April 1994. They were added to, of course, by uh, the, uh, sorry, and the CGE, the Commission on Gender Equality, were there. They were added to by the Commission uh, for the Promotion and Protection of the Rights of Cultural, Religious, and Linguistic Communities, uh, in, uh, which is the only reminder of the idea of group rights retained in our Constitution. As Paul said, this is the fourth branch of government, in addition to legislature, executive, and judiciary, and uh, often known as the integrity branch. My purpose in raising the Sarafina issue was to suggest that the Foundation may wish on a future program of this nature to challenge Parliament on its role under Section 55.2 of the Constitution as its oversight role and its holding of the executive to account. Uh, that is uh, a lot of uh, what Zondo uh, uh, also included in his, in his commission. I'll deal with the courts under three heads. The strengths, their strengths, the challenges they face, and what is to be done, in a, in a phrase redolent of uh, other agendas. Let me be quite clear from the outset. My overview, my overwhelming uh, sense and sentiment, is that the courts have succeeded in showing courage and skill in giving expression to the concept of limited government under law, and in promoting the socially transformative imperative which our constitution champions. If there are failings in either of these areas, in my view, the responsibility rests primarily with parliament and the executive at every level of government. And secondarily, with the citizenry of this country as a whole, which has failed both to live up to that transformed vision and to hold government accountable. And in that broad uh, uh, assessment, I include the holders of power outside government, the holders of private power, as well as the mass of the citizenry. And that, this has happened notwithstanding the magnificent efforts of many civil society organizations, both prominent and modest. So to the strengths. Our courts are able to rely on the constitutional foundations, and I don't have time to read section one of the Constitution to you, but you should almost know it off by heart. It is the most special part of the Constitution, because it may only be amended with a 75% majority of members of the National Assembly and the concurrence of six of the nine provincial legislatures. The rest of the Constitution can be amended uh, by uh, the attainment of a two-thirds majority. And included in there is the rule of law, the supremacy of the Constitution, non-racialism, non-sexism, uh, the, the achievement of human dignity, one of the most foundational rights, which opens many doors, the achievement of promotion of equality and the securing of fundamental rights and freedoms. So it's got a very solid foundation on which to pursue uh, its jurisprudence. Secondly, Within limits, the inherited and accepted practices of professional pride, I'm talking about lawyers now, professional pride, discipline, and peer regulation. That is what we inherited in 1994 overwhelmingly. Thirdly, a generally good standard of legal education, both at tertiary level and through the profession. Fourthly, generally open access to court by the media and uh, members of the public. 
vigorous public scrutiny from the media, academics, and civil society more generally. Liberalized rules of standing. Now, uh, I appreciate I'm not talking to an audience of lawyers. Standing to sue is the key that opens the door of the court to allow somebody to become a party to sue uh, and to take on an issue. We used to, in our law, be bound by having to, to show the court that you had a direct personal stroke financial interest in the matter. Now people can go to court, and this is a tool in the armory of civil society, on behalf of a group of people, on behalf of uh, 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 pu the public as a whole and in the public interest. And many of the most significant decisions of our court of our courts led by the Constitutional Court have been brought by non-governmental organizations, organs of civil society, or indeed in the Glenister case to which Paul referred, an individual uh, suing in the public interest. We also uh, have uh, ample evidence of the willingness of non-political, uh, uh, non uh, Sorry, non-profit organizations to test matters both inside and outside court. I want to also pay tribute to the few extraordinary uh, law journalists. Uh, I was just saying to Ariane at the tea break, for years in this country, there was a single reliable uh, reporter on law and the courts. Her name uh, is Carmel Ricard. She still is active, fortunately, there has been, particularly in the uh, uh, Arion's, uh, Arion's uh, stable, but outside that as well, reporters who understand law, who are educated in the law, and who understand the courts and some of the nuances. And when the courts rely for their survival, because they're called the weakest branch of government, they don't have the authority, they have the authority but they do not have the police force to enforce their judgments. What they have to rely upon is their legitimacy. And legitimacy can be measured, at least in one measurement, by the extent of public confidence they enjoy. And if the public does not understand the role, the proper role of lawyers and courts, then it's very easy for uh, the, the citizenry to dismiss them and to begin to, undeny them, uh, to uh, undermine them, and it gives rise to some of the scurrilous po political statements made by public party, political party leaders uh, over the years. There are pockets also within the courts uh, of exemplary adherence to the ideals set by the values of the Constitution in the organization of the courts and the profession, and there's a generally robust commitment to transformative justice through the Constitution in a time of what is, being co is called lawfare, uh, and I'll happily expand on that if it arises during, during uh, question time uh, of the panel discussion. In sum, without mentioning a single case name yet, uh, I would argue that the judicial record can be, uh, post-1994, can be divided relatively neatly into two periods. 1994 to 2008, that's the initial period of office of the founding fathers and mothers of the Constitutional Court, the founding parents of the Constitutional Court. In some ways, it was uh, an easier time because there were such flagrant denials of justice and human rights inherited from apartheid that the public in South Africa could happily support the court in taking relatively controversial decisions like outlawing uh, the death penalty. The period since 2009, which happens to coincide with the accession to office of President Zuma, has been much more fraught. Uh, and the new generation of judges, and I'm not being aware of the presence of at least one of the justices in that initial court here today. I'm not in any way minimizing the difficulties that initial court faced, faced. but in my view, uh, it rose above those difficulties and set a magnificent precedent for the courts in the future. Okay, to the challenges. One, executive influence on appointments both to the bench and to leadership roles within the judiciary. 
I think uh, it's fair to say, no, I will not say that because it reflects too badly on, 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 on um, yeah. I don't think the Constitutional Court today is as strong as it was uh, in 1994 to 2008. Secondly, and hugely relevantly, the dysfunctionality, the scandalous dysfunctionality of the Judicial Service Commission, in particular since 2009. The abject failure of the disciplinary structures and processes in place under the aegis of the JSC. I need only to mention the names Klope, Mutata, Maluleke, Parker, uh, for you to know uh, how far short uh, of what is expected of it, of its constitutional duty, the JSC has fallen. Next, poor and erratic standards of leadership of the judiciary, again, particularly over the last decade, decade, no names, uninformed and malevolent public criticism by party political leaders and others, the abuse of legal process to delay the pursuit and finalization of prosecutions and others. It's called, I, I sort of resent, I thought in my reading of history that Stalingrad was about the heroism of the Soviet defenders fighting street to street, room to room, to prevent the Nazis from taking uh, Stalingrad. But the Stalingrad defense strategy is cast altogether in a negative uh, light. The, t the timidity of the judiciary on occasion to stand by their judgments, leading to their entertaining applications for rescission and too readily granting leave to appeal and perhaps even recusing themselves uh, from particular matters. I think that's a problem. Rapidly falling standards of respect and decorum displayed, indeed flaunted, by several senior members of the practicing profession, which are not confronted either by the presiding judges or by the professional bodies which are meant to regulate the practitioners by the Legal Practice Council and the Bar Councils. Insufficiently robust and rigorous judicial education. The growth of a small but vociferous group of academic commentators who characterize the Constitution as a Mandela sellout. It's not happening in this province, but it's happening in Gauteng. Occasional glaring mistakes made by judges and Separate from that, I suppose, separate point, the cynical misuse of the authority by judicial leadership to allocate cases. The deliberate undermining of the NPA by the Zuma regime and its lingering aftermath. The careless and defiant utterances and actions of Klope JP damaging the legitimacy of the superior court judiciary. The inexplicable delays by President Ramaphosa in suspending Judge President Klope. Waning public confidence in the administration of justice despite many signal victories for the rule of law and the constitution. Afrobarometer survey of 20th of August 2021 shows that. The debilitating effects of lawfare, the temptation to give in to a bullying series of offensives from the corrupt and the autocratic forces. The majoritarian legislative and administrative hegemony resulting in minorities resorting to legislation in essentially political issues. The court at times succumbing, politicizing the judiciary and judicializing politics. Those are the, those are the challenges. Finally then, what is to be done? Firstly, review and reform of the JSC, particularly its composition and its disciplinary processes. Secondly, widespread public education about the transformative essence of the Constitution and the centrality of the court's role in holding the executive and legislature to account. It's always astonished me that uh, government does nothing about public education on the Constitution. I do remember uh, a, a speech in surprise by Minister Jeff Khadebe when he was appointed uh, as Minister of Justice in 2008 or 9, it must have been 2009, by President Zuma, because he discovered there was a six million rand budget for uh, uh, constitutional education in the department. I think they use it mainly to print these little books. 
in all, of official, all 11 official languages uh, appropriately. Thirdly, we need support for those within the judiciary and the profession, including the National Prosecuting Authority, who seek to maintain professional honesty and ethical practice. Fourthly, we need increased support for non-profit organizations, CSOs, who are active in the field and whose track record indicates their efficacy. We need support for public interest law practices whose activities widen access to the courts and to the commercial firms who have pro bono departments who lend their services gratis to non-profit organizations to take immensely important cases uh, and to establish legal precedent. We need to encourage responsible and accurate law reporting by the very few knowledgeable journalists in the field and we need the widespread dissemination of, dissemination of their and related reporting on the administration of justice through novel means like podcasts, social media, radio programs, and, uh, and so on. The greatest danger in my mind in this sphere is that frustration, both of litigating parties, sometimes reflected on the bench, will lead to what Chief Justice McWing uh, described as a cake, textbook case of judicial overreach, the, the judiciary going beyond its authority under the separation of powers. I fundamentally disagree with his comment in that case, which is known as EFF2 uh, in 2017, but that is a danger. In conclusion, I'm a person, uh, perhaps like Paul Hoffman, of cautious but I hope realistic optimism. I'm familiar, both at my university and elsewhere, of a new generation of outstanding academics who subscribe to the ideals and the values in the Constitution drawn almost exclusively from people of color. There are signs of a shift in the JSC if the appointment session in October last year is anything to go by. We must never forget the magnificent work done by Thousands of magistrates in the lower courts of this country. We tend to focus on the judiciary, but it starts in the magistrates' court, and they have a really tough professional life, and we ought to uh, celebrate them from time to time. But really what animates me is the following. The idea of limited government under law survived sustained humiliation and repeated attacks under colonialism and apartheid in this country. Yet it became the glue of our negotiated compromises uh, from 1990 through to 1996 and perhaps even since then. Surely it must live on, provided that we organize around and fight for its strengthening. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Hugh. That was, uh, again, fascinating, and I think very constructive in the suggestions that you make regarding the defense of the judiciary in the period to come and how we, what we can do about the problem. Uh, our next step will be a, a panel discussion, but I think we can take a break for about five minutes. Uh, while we're doing that, oh, Please write questions, that any questions that you might have regarding the uh, contributions made so far by our four speakers. Uh, we'll collect those and then we'll, uh, we'll use those as the cue to the questions that we will put to the panelists. So please take advantage of the next 10 minutes, let's say, to write your questions and we will then have people who will come around and collect them from you. And uh, that will then open the way to our next uh, item, which is the panel discussion, which will be moderated by our own Tyler Dallas, who's the head of our constitutional programs. So a breather of 10 minutes, write your questions, and we resume at 20 past four. I wish to put it plainly, 
that the government has taken a firm decision to release Mr. Mandela unconditionally. I look to the future with confidence and I appreciate the good spirit and the earnestness and the honesty which was a hallmark of the discussions. The Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided to award the Nobel Peace Prize for 1993 to Nelson Mandela and Frederick Wilhelm de Klerk. We did share and kindly participate in moments that in all humility on our parts might have helped her to shape our country, our continent, and in modest ways, the world. For me, the glass in South Africa is half full, it's not half empty. I also believe we have the capacity to resolve the outstanding problems and to remain as we were when we entered into our agreements, a beacon of hope for the rest of the world. Thank you very much.
I have the fun role of pulling together all the different ideas and views that have been expressed and looking at how journalists, Chapter 9 institutions, NGOs and the courts can continue to ensure South Africa remains a constitutional democracy. Uh, you were already handed your question cards, which some of you have already handed in. For those of you who haven't finished writing, please just, uh, when you finish, pass them to the side of the rows and we'll collect them. And then Dave will help me in selecting a few that we can read today. We also received some questions online, so we'll be reading some of those out for those who are participating online. So we've already said the Constitution remains under pressure. You've listed some events and the role each of these respective bodies have played to defend it. Adrian, I'm going to start with you. The DA is currently in court to try and have the ANC's cadre deployment policy declared unconstitutional. The ANC argues that this policy constitutes free speech. Yet every single decision ever taken by the ANC's deployment committee is a closely guarded secret. Adrian, how do you respond to this free speech claim, especially in light of Parliament's new hate speech bill, which poses a real threat to free speech in South Africa? And what impact does this bill have on investigative journalism and our multi-party democracy? That's a mouthful. <laughs> um, I'll try to make them short. I'm going to pause the first question. To, no. Um, look, let's start from the top. So I, I'm not sure how if the DA is going to will win this case. I, I don't think it's a clear cut case. Um, I think the, the the concept of what we call in South Africa cadre deployment, uh, which you can just call, call deployment, is a global phenomenon, not unique to the ANC or South Africa. Uh, I'm sure in um, the United States uh, government, federal government, is uh, people who are aligned to President Biden's party and thinking and 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 uh, line of the party, um, as there are people in the Western Cape and Cape Town government um, who come from the DA. The difference is um, that a number, a lot of these people. The, the, the difference is, cadre deployment of cadres is not corrupt, of uncorrupt cadres. I think if if cadres were deployed to ESCOM, who didn't steal Kusile empty for many years and who ran that power station very well, we wouldn't have been having this conversation and the DA wouldn't be in court. So I think it's around what happened with the absolute corrupt um, hollowing of entities by cadres as part of patronage networks in the ANC that runs from the top right to the bottom, as we saw with Posasa. Um, Freedom of expression, it would be lovely to have those minutes. Of course, I would love to see them, the, the, the meetings of the ANC, um, CADA committee, deployment committee. Um, President Ramaphosa, of course, testified about this before the Zonda Commission um, and was criticized heavily by, by Chief Justice Zondo in his final report for his um, testimony. Um, Let's see how that case uh, uh, ends up. I don't want to run the, the, the judgment um, uh, ahead. I do think that um, in terms of the hate speech bill, as you correctly said, poses threats. Um, we participated as journalists, journalist organizations in the, in the hearings in Parliament. We have submitted our, our criticism and critique of the hate speech bill. And it's a difficult one because it, the purpose put forward is to to do away with racism, you know, in our society. And of course, I don't think, I hope not, no one in this room would disagree with that view. The question is always, you know, how wide, how do you define that? And how do you make sure it is foolproof not to be used for other purposes? Um, and, and that is where, where, the, where the detail becomes impossible. So there's a lot of detail around the four, four definitions, I think, of hate speech at now 15 and the problems with all of that. It's something we will be keeping a very close eye on. So just to your point, you're basically saying that the policy isn't the problem, but it's the application of the policy in this case. Um, I just want to read a, a quote by Professor Pierre de Fosse in his Constitutionally Speaking blog, where he says, the problems now were widely associated with deployment, endemic corruption, the collapse of service delivery, and the broader collapse of the state cannot be fixed merely by invalidating the ANC's cadre deployment policy. Even in the absence of a deployment committee, the party will continue to be able to exert an outsized influence on the appointment of individuals to the public administration and other public institution, at least for as long as it retains its electoral dominance. Hugh, how do you respond to this and what Adrian has said regarding the inability of courts acting alone, as you did discuss earlier, to ensure effective accountability and transparency? 
what role must the courts play in the future? So, uh, somebody's got to bring the case first. Uh, the courts cannot act, uh, and one, one must always remember that the courts cannot uh, solicit uh, litigation. Uh, they can encourage it by their judgments uh, and by the liberalized uh, the, the interpretation of the liberalized rules of standing to sue, uh, as I mentioned. But I think that the um, the, the the I'm going to go to the dangers because I think this case uh, that has been raised here exemplifies some of the dangers uh, which beset the courts. The courts have to decide issues which are brought to them. They can't pass the buck. Uh, they've got to make a decision. And that gets appealed, perhaps endlessly in some cases. Uh, and then there's an ultimate uh, answer from the court. So the courts can't avoid it. But uh, th there's a young scholar who's recently published an article uh, uh, encouraging the courts to engage in what she calls esoteric decision making. And what that means is that in a highly politically charged, with a highly politically charged issue, which comes before a court, the court should be very careful to rely on uh, established precedent, uh, the, the ordinary rules of the game of interpretation of language, uh, if as far as is possible, uh, apolitical uh, instruments uh, and methodologies in order to reach the right conclusion according to the values of the Constitution and the constitutional provision, if that is the one that is at stake, or the parliamentary statutory provision, which is being in interpreted. So uh, I think it, th that, the, that the courts are too often uh, and increasingly through lawfare, and let me just say on the lawfare issue, lawfare was originally uh, defined by an American ge uh, general, military general uh, in, in Iraq uh, as the use of, of law to pursue war. Uh, to impose the views of the invading authority, uh, the invading country, on, uh, on, on, the, on the local population. And, I mean, we can think back in our own history and every single imperial stroke colonial history for the use of the law to impose the views of the conquering authority on the local uh, inhabitants. But law, as a sword, has, of course, the wonderful... Uh, uh, not ambiguous, but uh, almost contradictory quality of being a shield. So that that shield can be picked up by those being oppressed uh, through the sword and used against uh, the oppressors. And that was the case, and that is commonly now in its secondary meaning, meaning called lawfare. That was used under apartheid with limited success. It has been used uh, massively over the past decade with greater success in counteracting uh, corruption and uh, uh, unconstitutional action uh, by by the by the government. Uh, the most recent uh, phenomenon, though, that we see trend that you, that we see, is litigation being used uh, on what, on the surface, in my view, appear to be outrageous claims, uh, uh, and they come from. Uh, the quarters uh, which are generally allied to the RET faction uh, of the ANC uh, and, and, and others. So the courts, again, are placed in a really difficult situation. I haven't answered the question at all. I'm very well no, aware no, of that. Thank you. Can I have a stab at sure, it? Sure, Paul, yeah. yeah. Look, the, as far as I'm concerned, the DA has framed its claim in relation to cadre deployment far too widely. Obviously, a political party can appoint its favorite sons and daughters to political positions. The way that the case should have been pleaded and hasn't been pleaded is that in terms of the values and principles that inform the public administration and the organization of the state-owned enterprises, good human resource management practices 
that lead to efficiency and effectiveness and to a high standard of professional ethics in the public administration is, is what is required by the Constitution and that is inconsistent with the deployment of cadres in the public administration and the state-owned enterprises. Let me just give an example because I've used a, lo a lot of complicated language and I've referred to section 195 of the Constitution, which I believe is being, is being abused and has been abused by anybody using cadre deployment as the way to do things. So if you happen to be the municipal manager in Pofada, and you know that you hold that position because an ANC CADA deployment committee decided that you are an appropriate CADA to, to put there, and you're very pleased because the mayor serves on that CADA deployment committee at a local level, and you go about doing your job until one day you get to work on a Monday morning, and there are two memos on your desk. The one is from the mayor that says, my naughty teenage son borrowed the mayoral, uh, what's it called? Yengeni, the, uh, uh, the Mercedes, and wrapped it around a tree. The insurance is not going to pay. Please get me another car. And the other memo is from the manager of the uh, sewage works who says, our pump is on its last legs. We need to replace it. And the bottom line of both requests is a million rand or two. Well, if you are a professional public servant and you are prepared to efficiently and effectively run your job, you will say to the mayor, sorry, I need to spend money on the pump. If, however, you are a deployed cadre with your loyalty to the party rather than to the people, you are going to to make a plan to put the mayor in a car that sees to it that your job is safe. That is why CADA deployment doesn't work in real life and why it, it is really sets up a conflict of interest in that municipal manager. He's there not because he's the best man for the job and understands that he has constitutional responsibilities and values and principles he must uh, comply with. He's there because he's a loyal cadre and he needs to, to look after that. And that conflict of interest is why there is so much incompetence, inefficiency, and lack of merit in state-owned enterprises, dare I mention Eskom, and in our municipal and provincial and even national uh, public service. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for that example. I think just staying on that point, though, of that lack of what seems like internal integrity and ethics, would your proposed integrity commission be able to withstand the political pressure that we are seeing? The, 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 the function of the integrity commission is to deal with serious corruption. What we are talking about here is public administration done in accordance with constitutional principles. So the ordinary courts and in the ordinary course uh, should be able to strike down, and it's happened. The municipal manager of the Amatola District Municipality was appointed in, I think, 2008 uh, because he was a, a, a cater of the ANC, and he was appointed over a better qualified man who happened to be a former member of the PAC. And that man took the case to court, and the court said, this is unconstitutional. It's not a question of corruption, Arjan. It's a question of illegality. It's unconstitutional. I'm setting it aside and I'm appointing the PAC man in place of the ANC man. So there, there is judicial precedent for the abuse of the appointment system that is set up in the Constitution. And, uh, and, and if the DA had... Um, been better advised, it would not have gone with its blunderbuss, uh, uh, you know, with the shotgun with 25,000 pellets in it. It would have concentrated on what is actually wrong about cater deployment. You can't possibly run a country of 60 million people by choosing its public service and its state-owned enterprise employees from a pool of less than a million people. Can he eight work? 
Uh, you also did bring up ESCOM, and it would be wrong in this panel to not touch on that. So the ANC's latest idea is to declare a state of disaster to resolve load shedding. We saw rampant corruption and fraud exposed under COVID-19 states of oh, sorry under the COVID-19 state of disaster, with arbitrary freedoms restricted, and the NGO Sarkalicha in an ongoing legal battle to gain access to records of decision making, making taken then. Lawson, what role can NGOs continue to play in holding government to account and rejecting absurd ideas like this one? Um, yeah, uh, a <coughs> national state of disaster again. Look, I d I, I'm not convinced that the legal case can be made for the imposition of a, a, a national state of disaster in relation to ESCOM. There's no indication that government does not already have the power to do what is required in order to fix ESCOM. So unless somebody is able to indicate to me what special powers government would require under a national state of disaster, I don't think it will withstand legal scrutiny. Now we know that there are <coughs> a whole range of things that government can do, and they've been told by people, but they refuse to listen. Uh, <coughs> arguments about I'm being made about <coughs> cutting red tape, <coughs> fast-tracking procurement processes, all of those things can be done in an open and transparent manner. We have <coughs> the president due to deliver his State of the Nation address next week. He can make these pronouncements then. We've got the Minister of Finance delivering a budget two weeks thereafter. He can make budgetary uh, allocations in that budget to deal with the, uh, the crisis facing ESCOM. So I don't believe a national state of disaster is necessary. I don't think the legal conditions exist for it. And what is required is the political will and a coherent policy that government sticks to and, and implements. That, that's what we need. We don't need another state of disaster. Hugh, just your thoughts around the, the legal parameters. Could ESCOM or the energy crisis be classified as a disaster under the Disaster Management Act? Am I allowed to pass on? No, I won't pass on that one. Uh, the, the, I take my cue uh, because I'm not uh, that familiar with the provisions of the National Disaster Act, and one would have to look at the actual language that is used. But I take my cue from uh, an important uh, section of the uh, Bill of Rights, uh, which is section 37 of the Constitution, or, which admittedly refers to states of emergency rather the states of national, national disaster. Um, and, and the states of emergency may be declared only in terms of an act of parliament, so national uh, disaster, when the life of the nation is threatened by war invasion or general insurrection, disorder, natural disaster, or other public emergency, and the declaration is necessary to restore peace and order, okay? Now, against that kind of background, uh, I think that the, uh, the, the state of national, uh, national disaster, which was declared under COVID, I think, given the unknownness, if, I, if that's a word, of the impact of COVID and all of the imponderables at that point, I think it was a defensible decision and the court would have held it to be, have been a, a defensible uh, declaration. Given what we know about uh, ESCOM, for example, uh, given no, what we know about the uh, reasons why Medupe and Kusile, for example, have not delivered on uh, the energy which they are meant to, meant to have delivered, I think it would be a very, very, very high mountain to climb for the government to defend uh, the declaration of a state of national disaster here. Because the question must be asked, what, are the, what extra powers do they need in order to cope? Uh, uh, you know, under, under COVID, of course, we were restrained uh, uh, very uh, extensively in our freedom of movement uh, and others. But what do they need us to do now? What are they seeking to do? So that's me answer. Can I quickly come in on this? Yeah. So I would maybe like to, some, some, um, some discussion about this because it feels to me like we're on a bit of a slippery slope around procurement. The tender system has really destroyed... Um, service delivery to a large extent over the 30 past 30 years. The tender corruption was at the heart of ANC-sponsored corruption, right? Um, 
I am hearing increasingly from very reputable commentators and civil servants that, you know, this red tape is such a problem and we need to do with red tape because we want to deliver quicker. So there's a strong, if Andre the writer says, look, I cannot import a part of the machine in, um, at my power plant at Lataba because uh, I have to first get the company to be, have a BE partner, etc. It's going to take months. I understand that. But I think it's very dangerous if it becomes almost, if we come to a point where we say, let's just do away with all red tape because it's, it's, it's preventing SOEs and others from delivering services where, you know, we absolutely need, you don't have to call it red tape, call it whatever you prefer. Checks and balances. Checks and balances to make sure the tender, the tender system is not again an open purse under its state of disaster or not to, uh, you know, whatever reason, just because people want... Um, Want, want their cronies to get the tender. Thank you. Yes. Can you? I quickly say uh, w one of the one of my favourite seminars in the master's degree on constitutional administrative law uh, was taught annually by Advocate Vim Trengove, uh, whose name we all know. He 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 focused only on public procurement, and he would describe a seven-stage process for fixing the air conditioning in the Johannesburg High Court. And he described an actual civil servant who was the court manager or the facilities manager within the court who had none of the requisite background and training to see her way through uh, the seven-stage process. So there may be a case for simplifying the public procurement process. It was put in place, as I understand it, that seven-stage process, precisely to avoid the kind of uh, corruption that we have seen exposed. But if you take it all away, you get digital vibes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we're going to move to a different topic now. But in a piece on Politics Web earlier this week, Professor Kurs Milan of the University of Pretoria stated, the supposedly supreme constitution has broken down. Our help cannot come from the state anymore. Our help has to come from somewhere else. Communities will have to save themselves. Kasak similarly claims to Professor Milan that the greatest threat to our constitution is a complacent citizenry. Lawson, Kasak, and you in particular have been prominently calling for electoral reform. You have also noted the low voter turnout in the November 2021 local government elections as apathy, with the public opting out of engaging with a system they view as hopeless. Will the changes proposed by the Electoral Amendment Bill be able to restore public trust in the system? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let me maybe just correct one thing. I don't think it's apathy is the correct term uh, for that. People, people are very engaged politically in South Africa. It's a reject rejection of the current political system. It's a rejection of current political parties across the spectrum that are not attracting people to go and vote because they don't trust them all. So, and th that, that's, that's a serious indictment on the state of our politics in South Africa. It's not an indictment on the state of our constitution. Um, <clears throat> so the figures, if we go back to the, uh, you, you quoted, I think, 2021 local government elections, the 2019 national and provincial elections, the voter turnout was ridiculously low. But even apart from the voter turnout, 25% at least of eligible South Africans are not registered to vote. Um, in the 2019 na national elections, we had a, vo a potential voters roll of tw 36 million. Only 27 million actually registered to vote. That's a whole 9 million people who haven't even bothered to register to vote. <clears throat> so of that 27 million, um, I think about 18 million actually voted in that election. So 50% of the eligible voters. So that, that's where we are, and that, that figure is, is uh, the participation levels are, are, are increasing. Um, sorry, the participation levels are decreasing in each subsequent election. So it is a real, a real concern for South Africans, for our country, particularly when you look at the majority of those people who are not voting are aged between 18 and 29. And <clears throat> I don't think it's because they're apathetic, they're very, very concerned about the future of this country. It's their future. But 
uh, political parties are not putting <coughs> uh, on the table anything that they, they feel confident in voting for. Will the current bill before Parliament change any of that? Absolutely not. It's a, it's a it's 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 a mere tinkering with the current closed uh, list system to say okay because the constitutional court has said that we must allow independent candidates to stand in national provincial elections. We'll allow them to do so, but in a very uneven contest where independent candidates have to stand in regions against political parties not in the constituency, and the region is a whole province. So one individual candidate against a range of political parties in the Western Cape, Northern Cape, or wherever. <coughs> it's inherently unfair on independent candidates. And, it, <coughs> this is, and it, the, the debate has become a lot about independent candidates, and it should not be. It is about issues of accountability and getting our elected representatives closer to the people. And the only way of doing that is to have some kind of constituency system. Whether it's a single member constituency, uh, which has been proposed, for example, by uh, the Ministerial Advisory Committee that uh, reported a couple of years ago, or whether it's a multi member constituency that was uh, uh, proposed by Fensel Slabbert in his report back in 2002. That's the kind of electoral reform we need. And I think that will, be, uh, that will engage people more in terms of being able to identify who their representatives are and engage with them more meaningfully and ultimately to hold them to account. Paul? Yes, I think the, the, the problem with across the board uh, proportional representation is that he who controls the party list controls the politicians. So the politicians feel accountable, but they're accountable to the head office of their political party rather than to the people who voted for that political party on whose list the elected politicians were sufficiently high to, to um, take office. And of course the problem with the list is that everybody wants to be high enough on the list to actually make the cut. And so loyalty to party rather than to people is reinforced by that. I can see nothing wrong with the German system, which has been in place for a long time. I think it is what, essentially what the von Seilslubert uh, Commission uh, recommended. But I cannot see any political party in South Africa embracing that because their own self-interest is not served by making politicians more accountable to people and less accountable to party bosses. Thank you. Adrian, just going back to informing people, making sure that they understand what's happening, understand what's happening in local politics, you are in the business of informing the masses. What role can journalists continue to play to defend the Constitution in this way? No, we have to, we have to continue to, to report on these things without fear of favour. So, look, the SABC is, of course, has got the main responsibility, um, you know, the, the state broadcaster, to, to inform everyone in the country and to be free. Um, I spoke earlier about subscription, so, so we were forced, commercial media has been forced to introduce a subscription model. Uh, we've always sold newspapers. It's not something new, but, uh, you know, for many years, news was given away for free on the internet. But we were forced, because of the econ economics of the media, to introduce a paywall, which unfortunately means some articles are, are no longer available, you know, whether you read the New York Times or uh, the Washington Post or News 24. This is just the reality we face. Um, but I think uh, there's some very interesting things happening in the space. So you've got these uh, donor or philanthropy-funded organizations like Ground Up and Ama Bungani, Becky Sisa on the medical field, which really brings together... A, small group of niche journalists who then come to the big publishers like myself and say, look, can't we publish our work on your platform that reaches about two million people a day? And, and that works very well for us. So, so, you know, an organization like Ground Up um, that specifically has journalists in places outside of the big metros in South Africa where we don't necessarily have reporters, places like uh, Makanda where, where uh, a lot of these interesting service delivery cases went to court. We get those reportage through people like Ground Up, Amabungane, Begisisa, etc. So in a way, um, it's also led to the establishment of this new sources of specialized journalists in the fields of health, local journalism, investigative reporting, um, etc. I think um, 
Someone asked me in tea time, how long will there still be newspapers? It, it's been a question that, uh, that those in media has been debating for years, and it's, it's much more thumb-sucking than anything else. But look, it is, it is not going to be around for a long time. Um, that's just the reality of the business. I mean, big newspapers now have circulations of around uh, 20,000 max um, a day. You know, we, a, a, a publication like the Sunday Times that it had, used to sell 500,000 copies on a Sunday. It's now, I think, less than um, 150,000. Um, so uh, there will be much less newspapers in the future. Um, hopefully that doesn't mean much less journalists. I hope that um, all media houses um, find a way to transition into the digital space in a, in a way that's sustainable. We will have to convince our readers why we're good for them. And um, there's a phenomenon now in, in journalism that's called people checking out of news, which is a real danger, you know, where people, um, apparently it's got something to do with the three years of COVID, where people just feel it's all too much, I would rather sit on TikTok or Instagram and watch pictures of my grandchildren and, and roses, you know, which I also do of my children, not grandchildren yet, but, <laughs> but I, I hope, you know, people, these uh, guys and girls from, from, you know, school realize why news is important, and, and if they don't, maybe we're doing something wrong. Maybe we should go back to them and go back to that Australian judgment that I referred to, that the Concord referred to, to say media freedom means your freedom. It actually, we are there to, to represent you and to be your eyes and ears in the high courts, in the legislatures, on the streets of this country. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe that's something, well, I think that is something we should do better. Thank you. Paul, back to you. You have stated that the Chapter 9 institutions exist to bed down democracy as the integrity branch of government. Are you confident that these institutions are able to weather the stormy road ahead to the 2024 national elections and continue to uphold the Constitution and the rule of law? I'm very confident this is very nice vodka you've given me. Here. <laughs> Uh, look, the, the Chapter 9 institutions are there to stay. It's going to be very difficult. It is difficult to close a Chapter 9 institution. It's even difficult to fire an obviously em eminently fireable person. But that is the institutional machinery that gives those institutions the independence and the effectiveness that they are supposed to enjoy. That has been undermined not because of corruption, but because of CADA deployment in the, uh, the Chapter 9 institutions, that, that, that has led to a sort of slide away or a, uh, a, a greater fealty to a party political agenda than to constitutional principle. And of course, if you are there to strengthen and support, those are the words that the Constitution uses, the uh, constitutional democracy in South Africa, then you... If you stick to your task, you will be able to, to help. I think if, if the Integrity Commission comes along, it will make a big difference to uh, corruption within all institutions of state and within the private sector, and that a lot of the corrupt will just melt into the trees because they know that the game is over, rather than because they've changed their ways. That, uh, 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 corruption grows exponentially when impunity is the order of the day. It shrinks exponentially when impunity is not the order of the day. Lawson? Can I come in on that? Um, look, I think you know, ch Chapter 9 institutions play a critically important role in our, de in our, in our democracy. Uh, as uh, <clears throat> Paul said earlier, there's a whole chapter of the Constitution dedicated to those six institutions. And their primary reporting line is to Parliament. Uh, and there's something that those of you that have read the uh, Zonda reports will have come across, something called the Corder Report, uh, which uh, Professor Hugh Corder uh, produced sometime in the late 1990s, if I'm not mistaken, uh, at the behest of the then Speaker of the National Assembly, Freni Janwala, uh, while I was working for her, in, uh, coincidentally. <clears throat> and that report of, uh, of Hughes makes a point which has been taken up in the Zondo uh, recommendations that there needs to be a more structured uh, accountability mechanism for chapter nine institutions to report to parliament. Because what often happens, I mean, we hear about the stuff 
because Adrian publishes, uh, publishes it on News24 when there's a, a report that the public protector has published that involves a, 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 you know, a senior politician or something like that. Parliament gets dozens of reports from uh, the Human Rights Commission, the Gender Commission, uh, the um, CRL Commission and, and the like. And nothing ever happens to them. They never get discussed. They never get debated. Um, and that undermines the very purpose of those Chapter 9 institutions. So UCORDA's recommendation is that there should be a piece of legislation to entrench uh, <coughs> a, an obligation on Parliament to put in place a special uh, structure of Parliament, a committee that will receive these reports and ensure that they get looked at, debated, discussed. Because it's pointless having these Chapter 9 institutions if Parliament, the body to which they report, doesn't take them seriously. And that, that's the real danger that lies with those Chapter 9 institutions. Thank you. We're now going to move to some questions we've received from our online audience as well as our audience here today. I'm going to start with you, Adrian. So this is quite interesting. How will AI and chat GPT enable journalism to strengthen our constitution while opposing parties try hard with fake news to undermine it? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, thanks. Was that an online question? Was it from chat that GPT? Was, that was or? actually from the audience. Yeah. Oh, from yeah. a real person. Or from, from a real person. person. <laughs> Look, in, in my limited understanding of um, ChatGPT, which is all the rage at the moment, if you haven't played with it, please do. It writes poetry and everything. Um, you know, AI is, is very much part of our reality. Um, I think it's a massive slippery slope around the ethics around AI in all sectors, not only in journalism. I mean, you guys in academia must be, what's a nice phrase, must be very concerned. <laughs> Um, about first-year students, uh, you know, who's got a 2,000-word assignment for Monday morning um, that can be spit out in five seconds. Very well, good assignment, probably. So I think, um, I think the world, I mean, like the, someone explained it to me nicely on the weekend, it's the first major challenge by technology on the careers of white-collar workers. You know, blue-collar workers has had it for, for years, producing cars and manufacturing, whatever. But for the first time, lawyers, bankers, academics, and journalists could potentially be replaced by bots, um, well-trained bots at that. So I think, I think we're gonna ha it's going to be part of our future. I can't say that we don't want it, but I think we're going to have to start very slowly. I, I definitely don't know how it's going to defend the Constitution. I mean, if it may be, if we can train bots to help us identify, for example, on Twitter... Um, whether a tweet was posted by a real person or um, whether if looking at the trend of tweets over the past 24 hours, it seems like these 200 tweets came from, the certain, com, came from a certain network of people on Twitter um, that are loosely connected to, I'm just going to make up a country, Russia, you know. Um, that could be helpful. Um, and we've done some of these things. We've, we've seen some of those results, which are quite scary. I mean, I don't know if you guys... You shouldn't spend too much time on Twitter, by the way, because most of it is not real. Most of it is literally paid bot farms. But um, in terms of just journalism reporting, um, maybe it's a nice challenge to say, like, why would a real flesh and blood person sitting here today write a better story than a bot who listened to everything and summarized it? What can a human bring to journalism that, that AI can't? Um, but I do think we will see things like sports results and... Um, financial reports of companies, I think those things will happen, you know, very soon. Thank you. Next question, also from someone in the audience, is for Lawson. The Constitution guarantees multi-party democracy, however, this is under threat by smaller parties and coalition governments undermining the will of the voters. How can the Constitution uphold the will of the voters in this situation? Uh, <clears throat> Um, you know, um, I think Hugh made reference to section uh, one of the Constitution earlier, which uh, uh, entrenches the principle of a multi-party democracy in South Africa. Uh, I'm not sure that there's a danger that that's under threat. I mean, we have a National Assembly, I think, now with 17 political parties. So we certainly have, uh, that is multi-party democracy. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but I think the question is really directed at, at uh, the formation of coalition governments. And, you know, uh, questions obviously premised on, on what's happened recently in Johannesburg with a, 
a small minor, uh, representative from, from a very small minority party taking over the mayoral chains in, in the city of Johannesburg. And how does that happen? I mean, you know, and that's, that's the transactional nature of our politics at the moment, that, uh, you know, this was the, the, the deal what, that was done in order to, to cobble together a majority to be able to, um, to control the, the city of Johannesburg. And Adrian made reference earlier to, you know, Kenny Kunene being, uh, being sworn in as a councillor now in an MMC as well. So, you know, those are the kinds of transactional things. And I think, you know, those are the things that feed into w what we spoke about earlier in response to an earlier question about why voters stay away from the polls. Because the, the, these kinds of, of deals that get struck with no principle at stake says to people, well, why should I go out and bother to vote? And it, it is an undermining of the democratic will, but it's also, on the other hand, uh, coalitions are a product of the democratic will. Because it's the electorate saying to the political parties, we don't trust any of you sufficiently to give any of you a majority. And that is the voice of the electorate. Now, the responsibility then falls on political parties to say, well, this is what the voters have said. How do we now respond to that? And I think there's, there are examples from across the world, in Europe in particular, where coalition governments have been in place for many, many decades. And they've worked out mechanisms and the mechanics of how to have sustainable coalitions based on a policy program rather than the allocation of seats or um, you know, um, positions of authority, particularly positions which control procurement budgets, uh, which is where we seem to be at the moment. So I think we've got a long way to go um, as, a, uh, as a maturing democracy to be able to, to articulate what those roles should be, uh, having legally binding coalition agreements in place that says these are what we commit to as a coalition and uh, the, the signatories to that, the parties in that coalition are then legally bound to support those, uh, those positions and you can't just wake up one day and say well because somebody else is, uh, you know, is, is talking to me on the other side that I'm going to jump ship and go and form a coalition with someone else. So those are the kinds of lessons that we need to learn. Thank you. This next question is more of a statement than a question, but Paul and Hugh, I'd love you both to please speak to it. Um, should we establish a civil society oversight body for land reform? I'll start with you. <laughs> who's going to do the establishment? Who's we? <laughs> Uh, is the question, I suppose, or should uh, sh should such a thing uh, be established? I think that if there is sufficient uh, groundswell uh, of support uh, broadly in civil society t to uh, establish such a pressure group, uh, then then uh, uh, there's every reason to do so. Uh, the, the, the question would be, uh, what would it seek to achieve other than the provisions of the Section 25, which, uh, which is the property clause, which, uh, as Lawson, I think, pointed out, um, uh, doesn't need uh, any amendment uh, to allow uh, uh, redistribution of land without compensation, uh, for example. Um, the questions must clearly also, well, the question or the statement raises the question about uh, how far do you go back uh, if you're talking about restoration of land to uh, the original inhabitants of the, uh, of the society here. Uh, and and uh, particularly where we are sitting in the Western Cape and parts of the Northern Cape, and maybe even more uh, broadly, that may not be the obvious constituency that is thinking uh, that they're going to get the land back. Uh, I hope that that's helped. I mean, uh, the more the merrier in terms of bodies in civil society. <laughs> Paul? Yeah, look, in, in South Africa there is freedom. Is this thing died of natural causes or am I, st am I still on the air? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So it sounded very faint, but it's because the vodka's getting to me. <laughs> the, the, um, the Bill of Rights guarantees freedom of association. So if there is a groundswell, or if, even if there's three people who think that putting together 
a society for the implementation of Section 25 of the Constitution. They should feel, feel free to do so, and they can uh, make their voices heard by speaking to Arjan to give them some coverage in the media, by litigating in the public interest if there is a cause of action that they think that they ought to pursue, and by uh, a public interaction that brings more people to their way of thinking. You see, what is happening in South Africa politically at the moment is that we are transitioning from what has been a dominant party state. Certainly, the Constitution talks about multi-partyism, but because the same party has won every time with ever-decreasing uh, majorities, the, the dominant party state uh, has, has become the order of the day. And we're transitioning away from that towards coalition politics. We are seeing it in the highly populated um, metropoles already. Uh, we, we're seeing some really uh, extraordinary things happening. Apparently, some of these coalitions that are formed are formed because the members of the coalition want to be in the game. Now, Lawson uses the polite term, Transition, transactional politics, <laughs> but wanting to be in the game means wanting to control procurement and who gets which contract and all of the other cronyism and illegal activity that is on the go. So we're taking baby steps into coalition politics. Coalitions work well if they are properly managed, if there are binding agreements between coalition partners, and if the parties to the coalition watch each other and hold each other accountable. That's really uh, where we're headed. Lawson, this next question is also for you. How important is a free functioning private business sector in realizing third generation rights, i.e. socioeconomic rights, and how does one achieve this with um, unstable energy supplies? Had to quickly try and understand that. <clears throat> no, look, the, uh, private business, private uh, companies have responsibilities in terms of the constitution. They can't, you know, it's, it's uh, applicable to them as it is to others. And certainly, you know, <clears throat> there's been a move in recent times that companies have to report on their ESG uh, 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 issues in their annual reports. Uh, but those obviously only apply to listed companies. Uh, companies listed on the JSC you've got a, you know economic, social, and uh, environmental reports. The impact of businesses on on those uh, aspects of of society and communities. Um, but you know, I think we we need to learn the the, the lessons of the the Zondo Commission in terms of getting ethical business leadership back at, at at the top of the list of priorities in South Africa. I think we've seen. Far too much slippage, you know, and that's at one extreme of the, the looting and corruption, which I spoke to earlier, but needing to hold private sector actors to account for their role in that. But it leads to a slippery ro a slope of uh, 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 an absence of ethical leadership at a whole range of levels. And, you know, businesses exist within a society, within a community, and have a responsibility uh, in, in that regard, and I think we need to we need to have serious uh, discussions about the quality of leadership in South Africa, not just in the political sense, but at a broader sense in terms of uh, the private sector as well as civil society as well. You know, uh, as well as you know uh, other other as, uh, sectors of our of our society. But I think it's it's part of that. What do we as a as a country want to achieve, and what are the different roles that each uh, sector of that society can play towards helping us achieve that, uh, and it, you know, it's got, it, the private sector has got to be brought into that conversation at, th at that level. Thank you. So we are running out of time to end. I'd just like to ask each of our speakers, uh, in a sentence or less, to those of us who are joining us here in person, those online, and specifically those in the audience who are a younger generation that are going to come forward and continue to defend the constitution. Why do you believe the Constitution is worth defending? What motivates you to fight the good fight? Hugh, I'll start with you. Because it represents the best of human endeavor and achievement 
arising out of the most extraordinarily hostile origins. Thank you. Adria? Can, can you speak for all of us? I'll, I'll, let me stick to my trade. I think, um, you know, we need to fight for our constitutional rights, uh, freedom of expression under Section 16. I mean, that is empirical and at the core for me of, of, of a functioning democracy is freedom of expression and the right to criticize. I mean, I published a book two years ago with my colleague Peter de Tuey called Enemy of the People with the face of the president on the cover. And I'm still not in prison, you know. I mean, a lot of journalists, a lot of my peers in other countries very close to us and elsewhere in the world would, would not have been able to do that. So let's not forget that. Um, it's important. And, and yeah. Thank you. Lawson? Look, I mean, I think it's critically important. You know, this, this constitution, constitution, just to prove to you, I do carry a copy with me. Uh, <clears throat> um, you know, it's a product of centuries and decades of struggle. It didn't magically appear overnight. Uh, it's something that has been hard fought for. And, you know, it provides, as I tried to say earlier, it provides a roadmap to realize the vision that it espouses of a, 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 a more equal, prosperous country. And, you know, it doesn't give us uh, the, the, you know, the GPS coordinates for every step of the way, but it gives us, tells us where we are and where, what our destination is. We've got to figure out the journey to get there. And this provides us a healthy, healthy hints on how and uh, to get there. And particularly for young people, you know, this is a, is a roadmap, and we, we need to build on it. We need to constantly build on it. And, you know, I think um, some, somebody, uh, Paul spoke earlier about, you know, the, the oldest uh, constitutions in the world. They, they've all gone through, you know, various iterations. Um, they get changed from time to time. Different uh, generations come up. And the the challenges that face different generations are different, and we, we've got to respond to them, but with, within the broad uh, parameters that that are set that is set out here. So it's something that I think, as South Africans, we should be extremely proud of having produced this, as De, uh, uh, Hugh said so eloquently, out of a very difficult journey. And it's something that I think is going to stand us in good stead for many decades, if not centuries, to come. Thank you. And Paul, to end. Gee, how do I top that? <laughs> Very difficult. <laughs> I was going to just say I agree with Hugh, but I, I suppose I've got to sing for my, um, for my supper, for my gin. Yeah. Look, it's like this. South Africa is a very diverse country with a very difficult history. It was under the yoke of colonialism for centuries. It was under the yoke of apartheid between 1948 and 1994, if you want to. And what the miracle of the new South Africa is that everybody was able to form a strong consensus around the negotiation of a constitutional democracy under the rule of law in which open, transparent, if you like, um, accountable and responsive governance is entrenched 75% majority wise in section one of the constitution. We, we owe it to the founders of the new order and to the younger generation to do everything that we can to see to it that the constitutional dispensation is successfully implemented by politicians who understand what their obligations are under the Constitution and that their primary fealty is to the Constitution and the rule of law and not to what party bosses may be telling them from whichever party's headquarters apply. What we need to understand when we, when we strive to implement the, con the Constitution is that the alternative is too ghastly to contemplate. And I'm not going back to 44 BC, where I started today. The, the alternative is too ghastly to contemplate in, in current context. That's why the Constitution is the best way forward. Thank you. And on that note, thank you to our panelists for joining us.
We've now heard all about the four players that are going to play an enormous role in the coming years in, main, in ensuring that we remain the kind of constitutional state that the authors of the Constitution had in mind when they drafted the 1996 uh, Constitution. But with any process like this, it's always advisable to get another final view from a wise man, a man who has seen it all and who can bring new perspectives to the discussion we've had. And that man is Muletsi, Muletsi Mbeki. Uh, Muletsi is going to now give us his take on all of this after we've, he's heard the inputs from uh, our panelists, uh, and after he's considered the role of investigative journalists, of, of our chapter nine institutions, of, of our NGOs and of our courts. Muletsi, can you give us your wisdom? <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, I am very saturated uh, with the wisdom about the Constitution, and, and I have to thank the F.W. de Klerk Foundation for convening this discussion about the Constitution, because most of the time we are all very busy with other things, uh, although we know we're living within the context of the South African Constitution. But, but we, we, we don't devote enough time to, to thinking about it. So I think this is an, a, an important initiative to, uh, to continue with it, the discussion about the Constitution of South Africa. I was especially struck by uh, the, the 44 BC comment from Paul, where is he? Uh, yeah, there he is. Uh, when I, when I was driving into the, into the hotel, I was following this beautiful convertible maroon Maserati, which, which is dri driven by this aging juvenile, as far as I could make out. <laughs> so, so, so when Paul mentioned the confusion of the Romans going back to 44 BC, I was thinking when he was talking that actually the Italians are still as confused as they were in 44 <laughs> BC. If, if, if you look at the Italian government today, what a dog's dinner that, that, that government is. Some of them support Zelensky in Ukraine, others support Putin. Now, how do you do both but the Italians do it? They, they suppose both sides. But they can produce the Maserati. Despite all the confusion since 44 BC, they can produce this incredible technology, which uh, uh, I was in a little Chinese car rented from the airport <laughs> following, and I was saying, why am I not in, the, in, in, this, in this Maserati? So yes, we need the constitution but we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves. Uh, the Italians have survived for centuries with their confusion, but they keep going. And they, can pre and they, they still produce some incredible designs. In fact, the suit might be from Italy, I don't know. <laughs> so. Now, about our constitution, when I was asked to talk about the su summation and overview, the point I, I thought I should make, the opening point I should make, is that 
1996 Constitution was not our first democratic constitution. Our first democratic constitution was the Cape Constitution of 1853. Now, what lesson do we have to draw from that? The lesson we have to draw from that is that democratic constitutions can be torn up and thrown away. We have had a democratic we had a democratic constitution in, in South Africa, which was the Cape Constitution. It started to get thrown out, out by Cecil Rhodes when he drew what was called the Glen Grey Act in the Eastern Cape to reduce, to increase the qualification for, for qualifying to be a voter. This was, that was the first nail on the coffin. The second nail was the piece of Ferenichi, where the British, who had written the 1853 constitution, admittedly in, in consultation with the South Africans, they thought gold and diamonds. Now, this comes first. We don't want another war with the Boers, so they are not interested in the democratic constitution, so the Boers started, the British started compromising on the democratic constitution. And eventually they tore it up in 1909 with the South Africa Act. Why is this important for us? It's important for us to remember that this constitution can also be torn up again. So the point of defending the Constitution is very important because we don't want a repeat of what we lived through after 1909, after, after, after the tearing up of the first democratic Constitution in the South Africa Act. From 1909 until 1994, we were at war with one another in South Africa, which we needn't have been if that Cape Constitution had been extended to the northern provinces, which the British led the people in the Cape to believe that's what they were going to do. But the British changed their minds because they wanted the gold and the diamonds now, and they said, let, let us settle with, with, with the Boer generals who don't, who don't like the Constitution, uh, the, 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 the democratic Constitution. The other point which I think we, we have to remember, that sounds like a long time ago. There's another Constitution, again, involving our friends, the British, which they helped to tear up. And that was the democratic Constitution of Iran. In 1953, Iran had a government which was a democratic government, which was elected, and it decided, its parliament decided to nationalize the oil deposits of Iran. The British and the Americans didn't like this. BP, by the way, was one of the main oil companies in Iran at that time. So, they decided they are going to defend their oil interests. So they set up a coup d'etat in Iran, led by the CIA, and of course MI5 or 6, I can never tell which one is for domestic and which is for external, but MI something. So when you hear the word MI, be very afraid when it's, it comes from England. So they overthrew the, this democratically elected government of Iran. The prime minister was called Mohammed Mossadegh. They overthrew the government and they put in a so-called absolute monarch of, uh, of the Shah. So we, we who are South Africa is an enormously wealthy country. So where you have all this wealth, 
like we have in South Africa and in Southern Africa. There is always the temptation to sacrifice everything in order to get to the wealth. So this is a risk that, 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 that we sit with in South Africa. After listening to these presentations this afternoon, and I learned a great deal from them, I've been asking myself, if there was another effort like happened in Iran or like happened in 1909 to tear up the democratic, con are the institutions that we heard about today, can they stand up and and fight against the bad guys. And we know who the, who the bad guys, they're already there. <laughs> EFF is one of them. The ANC itself. You know, I will tell you a story, although I will leave the names out. One day I was sitting with one of the ANC ministers at his home, and he starts complaining about the democratic constitution in South Africa. So, so I said to him, but I know you were part of the people who wrote this constitution. Now, how come you're complaining to me? Oh, no, he said it wasn't us. So I said, what do you mean it wasn't us? You are an ANC minister. You are in the National Executive Committee. No, he said by us, he meant the Africans in the ANC. So I said, okay, who wrote it? He said the Indians in the ANC. <laughs> So, so now I'm thinking, hello, now, where are we here? So, so I decided, no, I'll leave this one pass. It's, it's way above my head. So I carried on with the business I had. This man was a minister. Then many months later, I'm sitting with my father's lawyer, who happened to be an Indian woman. She complains about the Constitution, so I'm thinking, now this is it. <laughs> she, so I ask her, but you were part of the writing of this Constitution. Oh, no, she says it wasn't us. So, so what do you mean it wasn't you? You were there, you wrote it. Oh, no, she says it was the Jews in the AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. The, the, these guys, they, they tell you they love the Constitution. I take it with a pinch of salt because they are the ones who wrote it, but now they are blaming somebody else for, uh, for, for what goes on in the Constitution. I don't want to, 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 to go further into this, but I just want to say, to me, the real threat to the Constitution of South Africa today is our economic problem. Can you put up the, this is the real threat to, the, to, 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 to democracy in South Africa, is the massive unemployment and poverty we have in this country. This is a social structure that I worked with the statistician general to come up with what is the social structure of South Africa? And you can see that the largest social group in South Africa are the underclass and the unemployed. Now, a society like that is totally unsustainable. That is the reality about South Africa. It's our democracy is really on a short lifespan. Because with a society like that, it's a totally unstable society. For example, if you look at the elite and middle class group, it's only 12% of, of our society. In the United States, the same group is 40% of the American society. The largest group, where the largest group is there, is where the the middle class and, and professionals and so on uh, would be if you looked at the social structure of the, of the United States. So the real challenge that democracy in South Africa faces 
is that. That is the more immediate challenge. We have to restructure our society in order to get rid of this massively poor, unemployed population. We have to create jobs for that population that, popula that are commercially viable. We have to get that population out of social grants and out of social welfare. And you know what? The existing government wants them to stay on social grant and on social welfare because they go to them and say, if you don't vote for us, white men or Indian men or whoever will take your social grant away. So the real threat to democracy in South Africa today is that. And the big challenge is to our private sector in South Africa. It has to find a solution to that problem. The state can't solve that problem. It won't solve it. And as I point out, the existing ruling party benefits from it anyway. So the, my challenge to the private sector is they have to come up with a solution to that. And then the rest of us can support them to find, and that's what will entrench our constitution. That's what will entrench our democracy in the country. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Very well spoken. And I think that, uh, that you, you summed up pretty much the central points that were made by a number of the speakers. Thank you so much, Maletti. And I'd now just like to call on Alita de Klerk to close our conference. I would like to thank the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, our partners at this conference, all speakers, all panelists, and very importantly, all attendees for being here today, for enriching the debate about the importance of our Constitution. We are honored by your presence as it's the 33rd anniversary of FW's historic address to Parliament, which heralded dramatic changes to the South African political landscape, leading to the first democratic elections in 94 and the establishment of the South African democracy. The constitution to a young democracy requires a constant nurturing, respect, and adherence as a living institution beyond being just a document. All courts, chapter nine institution, the free media and NGOs seek in terms of their specific mandates to not only interpret and adjudicate, but also strengthen our constitution, but by ensuring that it's understood, lived, and enjoyed by our citizens. Thomas Jefferson once said, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. This is to serve as a reminder to governed people everywhere that the incremental, incremental erosion of the rights and freedoms of citizens by the very own leaders the world over can happen quickly often without being noticed. Our Constitution acts as our protector to our rights and our freedoms as citizens in our democracy. We all know how seductive is political power. Albert Einstein said, 
the strength of the Constitution lies in the determination of each citizen to defend it. Only if every single citizen feels duty-bound to do the, his share in this defense are the constitutional rights secure. Cadre de deployment plays an essential role in the destruction of institutions like ESCOM. The reason is because it gives the ANC the unconstitutional power to appoint corrupt officials on the basis of loyalty to the party rather than on the basis of demonstrated merit. The late Archbishop Tutu was quoted in 98 as saying, there is no way in which you can assume that yesterday's oppressed will not become tomorrow's oppressors. We have seen it happen all over the world. FW and I had conversations about what needs to be done in this ongoing global dialogue to defend constitutional rights, to enhance discussion and exchange thinking internationally to learn and harness the experience so that constitutions are understood, embraced, lived, and enjoyed by all governed citizens. In essence, FW envisioned an ongoing dialogue on defending constitutional rights and freedoms everywhere. In 2005, FW said, a new constitution is a powerful symbol of reconciliation, justice, and of ending centuries of conflict. With this sentence, I would like to close the conference today, which I think was great. We had amazing speakers. And to say what a great pleasure it was to be in your company. Thank you. Thank you, Alita. And now we'd like to invite everybody to join us for cocktails. I think it's on the deck bar. You go out, the, out of the back of the hotel and you turn right until you come to the deck bar. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for everybody who came and thank you for, for our team that, that works so hard to make this possible. Thank you. Thank you.